thanks to all of you, Fishing and DMV not only hit our goal of 100 Patreon subscribers, we blew way past it. I just want to say, guys, thank you so much for believing in this channel and helping us hit this major milestone. I want to talk to you about future plans. Our overall goal with this channel and our, and our big picture dream is to create a nonprofit that's really run by the people. The nonprofit's going to be focusing on supplemental stocking of our local waterways. We're going to also do boat ramp restoration and facility restoration. There's a lot of boat ramps on the Shenandoah, the Upper Potomac, the James, everywhere that just need a little bit of love and some TLC. We also want to do habitat cleanup days, youth programs, and just so much more. And what's great, a lot of these things will be voted on by the people of what we need to hit next. Now, are we going to be able to change the world with this nonprofit? No, but we can start making a difference in our local community. Now, to run a nonprofit, there's a lot of work, a lot of moving parts. So instead of having to go right off the gate and go door to door for companies looking for donations, we're going to make sure that when this thing gets started, it's homegrown. So what we're looking for is six hundred patreon supporters when we hit 600 patreon supporters that could be tomorrow that could be in two years it doesn't matter because i'll be here that whole time but when we hit 600 patreon supporters we're going to be filing for our 501 c3 to get this thing up and running and we can then go into more details each and every week on the show about what's in store and all the wonderful good that we can do in this fishing community if you would like to become a Patreon supporter and you want to join us on this journey, please feel free to check out the link in the episode description. All Patreon supporters will receive 5% off all their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off all of their orders to Tiger Crankbaits. They'll gain access to our private Facebook group community page where we have weekly prize giveaways and online tournaments and picture contests. And you'll also get private content from me, like the Doc Talk series, where I'll be going through kind of like what I did fishing wise that week. If you are interested in helping us eventually hit this goal of having a nonprofit that's really for the people of this great area, please check it out. Thank you so much. Fishing the DMV is the number one fishing show in our region, reaching thousands upon thousands of avid anglers and outdoor enthusiasts each and every week. As the show continues to grow, we are now actively looking for a company who would be interested in becoming the presenting partner of Fishing the DMV. If you are looking to promote your company to a highly engaged audience passionate about fishing, outdoor adventures, and conservation efforts in the Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania area, please email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Again, if you're a company interested in joining and becoming a part of the number one fishing show that continues to grow in leaps and bounds each and every month, email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we are making our way to Bugs Island with a guy from the Elite uh, the Elite 70 series, the Alpha Division, or the I guess the Alpha Trail, which is really just the solo. It's a cool ass name for it's yeah. a solo division, basically the non team version of it. Yep. yep. Ch like Chaz, like, you know, offline, we were talking a little bit like you've had a, a hell of a career and a hell of a story into fishing. And, and really, let's wind this thing back to the very beginning. Like, how did you get into fishing? Man, so so my dad originally got me into bass fishing when I was young, probably seven or eight, but not like the competitive side of it, I would say. My mom remarried and met my stepdad when I was probably 11. And my stepdad was big into tournament bass fishing. He um, did like a lot of like... Uh, what is it? Bass Nation, I guess, and team events like TBF stuff too, like uh, six man events and things like that growing up. So he kind of instilled the, uh, I guess, the love of bass fishing, tournament bass fishing in me. And then growing up on the lakes that I grew up here in Hampton Roads, which are phenomenal fisheries. And that's kind of where I kind of got my start was like we talked about off camera, the uh, the John Boat uh, Mafia, I guess, if you will. Um, that's an interesting culture that really like i feel like we get these waves in fishing it was like kayaking maybe yeah. it's still like 
in its top peak zeitgeist. But the other thing, and because of the Matt Downs, the tiny yep. the Tin Boat Nation things, that's really catching on too. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, church, shout out Church Tens. Um, yeah, man, we just, so, you know, we have an incredible pool of anglers, you know, talent down here where I live. And I, you know, just like up, you know, kind of up your way, it's just like every regional area's got its you know list of hammers right so we have a ton of great anglers here in the john boat area and that's kind of where i grip my teeth we have it's convenient right we've got five lakes that are all around a thousand acres or less um mm -hmm. super super diverse some got standing timber some lay out like a full reservoir some got grass some don't um so we get a really diverse pick and I fish a lot of truck stop tournaments. Um, they've been going on since the eighties, man. Everyone shows up, throws 40 bucks in the hat on a Sunday morning. You don't know where you're going every Sunday. So you draw it out of the hat and it kind of keeps everybody honest. Um, so, and it just, so we rotate. So if we go to, um, Lake Prince one week, then it's out of the hat the next week and we go to another one. So you're, you know what five you're going to go to, but you never know which one you're really going to until you show up the morning of. Um, on the Sunday. And that's kind of where I grip my teeth, right? That's where all of the really great anglers that uh, kind of that I looked up to, you know, as a kid, you know, 14, 15 years old, like skipping class and stuff to go and try to be like those guys in high school. Um, but that's kind of what, where I grip my start. What area of Virginia did you grow up in, in particular, just so for people at I, home? Yeah. So I live, same, really where I live now. So Suffolk, um, when I grew up in Windsor, Virginia, uh, originally from Norfolk, but you know, Hampton Roads uh, area of Virginia. And we got, it's kind of an underappreciated part of the state in terms of great anglers, man. We have a lot of really good, but like, you know, you got Smith Mountain Lake out West and then you have like the James River, which is pretty close to us, but then we don't have a lot of big bodies of water. We're kind of in the on the coast, not really near much, but within an hour of everything kind of. So that's kind of where, you know, I started with the John boat thing and, but I, you know, the James is an hour away. Kerr is two hours from my door. The Albemarle sound is an hour or less from my door. Um, you know, and then obviously Anna's about two hours away. So it, it work. I'm in a good proximity to, to go pretty much any direction and, and have incredible fishing. So it's been a great training ground, I guess. Uh, you it, could say. it really is. And, and, and for people that don't know, like I've had, um, I've had Matt Downs on the show. I've had Russ Hamilton and I'm going to get ripping lips on here too. They're, they're, they're on the to-do list as well. And mm -hmm. you look at this area that has so many electric motor only lakes. I mean, really you got Western branch. I mean, you got Lake Mead and I, I was thinking to myself before this interview, everyone talks about Alabama and places like that, where there's so much diversity of fisheries. No one talks about guys that their diversity, their experience, their homework was electric motor only lakes. And it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, <clears throat> I fished a bunch of small lakes, but they were all different. And so you got to get those tools in your toolbox early. Yeah. Yeah. So the, like I said, the electric motor thing too, especially is really picking up steam. We talked about that. Um, I don't do a ton of the electric stuff. It's mostly like 9.9 .9 or under horsepower where I'm at. Um, but it's, they come here. So Rip and Lips fishes this chain of lakes, yeah. even though it's technically horsepower strict. They fish several uh, Little Creek, I think, and what would see a Beaver Dam up on the peninsula they fish a lot too. Um, and that's a cool series. They've grown that. It's it's pretty incredible to see how the turnouts they're getting for an electric boat club. Um, shout out to Jason and Melissa. They're doing a really good job with that. I've actually never fished with them, mostly because of, I've just, always everywhere else i've got a scheduling conflict almost every weekend with something i can't fish everything it seems like and have a family and a wife and all that stuff so that that can be kind of hard but um yeah and it's, i guess it's, my, my, my initial point was you got your experience but it wasn't necessarily on big lakes and it's interesting you don't see that more from pros backstories like I had four smaller lakes near me that gave me the advantage of trying different things out. Cause you do hear about guys from Alabama, like, Oh, I'll go Smith fish Smith Lake and then Gunnersville and I get grass and clear blueback lakes. Yep. You got that, but on a smaller scale. Yeah, absolutely. And because we do, we actually got speed of that. We got blueback's in our lakes, um, which is kind of why it looks schooling. I mean, we got everything. It's crazy. And we got big ones too. I mean, I've caught two over 10 pounds out of Cahoon, um, in tournaments, weighed them in in tournaments. One was almost 11. Uh, called a 914 out of burnt mills that's the i grew up on burnt mills so that's kind of my i actually my stepdad and my we act, we had a house on burnt mills so i got to fish it for many years uh they shut the lake down actually too to do work on the dam so we got to cherry pick it really good for about oh, cool. five years yeah it was it was incredible there's never going to be a another fishing uh span like that in my life it was like uh 
I, I think I, I was just talking to my partner the other day. I, I caught 37 pounds on five, like just playing around when I was, you know, like 13 or 14 years old and didn't understand the or appreciate how incredibly difficult that was to do at the time. And now looking back, I'm like, oh my God, I'll never do that again, probably unless I go to Falcon or somewhere cool, you know, or Fork maybe. Um, but, but I mean, 30 would, bags are swimming around, around, right around me all, all over the place. It's just so hard to make a lightning strike five times in a row. <laughs> I think there's places, I mean, I mean, the res, um, the first tournament of the year guys at uh, Fountainhead National Park, or Fa Fountainhead Park, it was, took 35, no, 36 pounds for six fish to win. That's um true. And everyone's like, well, that's six fish. Like, oh, fuck, just divide it, divide that by six. And that's still a hell of an average for yeah, six fish. I mean, yeah, it's still over 30. So Burt Mills, like, I, so I got, we got really close with me and my buddy, Mike from the, um, from up near the mountains this year, he came down and fished with me at Burt Mills in August of this past year. And we had, we weighed in 29. We were close. We were close there. It was 29 some we had, but you know, we had, we were you know, a couple ounces away from, breaking 30 pounds in august here in one of these lakes you know and so don't everybody rush out and uh flood the lakes here in suffolk but yeah they're incredible um, did burnt mills really teach you your fundamentals and your fishing style or did your fishing style adapt later on um yeah i would say it, it definitely formed part of my style for sure um those fish in that lake are pelagic kind of with the standing timber they, they've really changed a lot since bluebacks got in there it seems like um, so now, you know, went from, I used to catch them on the bank and you can still catch them on the bank like you can right now, um, this time of year when they're coming shallow, but I, I've gotten really good at pre live scope before live scope came out. I was really good at chasing pelagic schools of fish in the middle of the lake. Um, How? Like, I don't even know a time before that. I feel like one of those kids that has only had a yeah, smartphone. Yeah. So now. that, yeah. So I, I, I've been in, I guess I've been heavy at this for, I'm 31 now. So I've been heavy. I mean, dedicated into tournament fishing for 16, 15, 16 years now, since I was 15 years old. Um, so I've been pretty, I, I had a little section in my, in my early twenties where I partied a little harder than I should have. Like we all do most, I, th I think we all do, but, um, but overall head down, like pretty, I mean, just, I missed a lot of birthdays and a lot of, you know, a lot of everything to go fishing, you know what I mean? So that's kind of, where I've been, man, just head down fishing hard in these lakes and learning, and then kind of just took that gradually other places to see how good I thought I really was, which not as initially, not as good as I thought I was. <laughs> uh, it didn't translate originally because the lakes are great, but they kind of pigeonhole you into um, spot fishing, I guess you would say. Right. I, I've kind of, I had to, I got really good at the lakes and, and figured out how to catch them. And then I felt like I was regressing as an angler because I wasn't going to places. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Does that make sense at all? But yeah, yeah I because, just, yeah, I, I had an interview. <laughs> Some reason guys, I, we were late for this recording. I had an interview before this and we're talking about that with title guys. And if you just fish the upper, like the James or the Potomac your whole life, it does pigeonhole you into that river rat mentality to where it's like you go to Lake Anna and your knees start shaking because it's like, oh God, it's a it's deeper than five feet. What do I do? Yeah, yeah. Um, you don't want to skew yourself uh, one yeah. way or the other. Yeah, it, it, it's it's hard. So I, I I felt like I was kind of regressing doing that. I don't fish in this, the lakes as much as I used to. Um, every now and then when I need to tune up and catch a 20 pound bag, I'll, I'll slide back out there and fish a little bit. But um, the fishing is incredible, but it's... It, I just was spot fishing too much, I think. And I learned a lot of, <clears throat> I was learning a lot of techniques to get me to that point. Um, and kind of develop my game, I guess, or my, you know, my toolbox, you would say, but it, it got to the point where like, <clears throat> I was winning a lot and not, you know, it just, it kind of. You plateaued. Yeah, I plateaued. Yeah, exactly. I plateaued. So I was like, I need to do some other stuff. I need to step out and, and do some do some big boat fishing and stuff like that. And so that's when I was like, I'm going to go try to do the opens. And, you know, of course, you know, I, I, I've, and I feel this way right now, the same as I do when I was a 15 year old kid, like I feel confident right now, I am going to fish at the elite series level or not the BPT level. I'm not doing that, but elite series, like it's still, uh, it's going to happen. I just don't know when, right. I'm just, uh, I'm still working towards that goal, but it's the goal is still as hot now as it was when I was 15 years old. So, um, but it's just a lot of hard work and doing what we talked about off camera, just fishing different bodies of water and getting better. And, um, 
you know, trying to get <clears throat> experience for every situation, man. You can't be a James River guy. And then when they drop you into Okeechobee, you're like, oh, this is not like, I mean, it's shallow, but it's very different, you know, than Okeechobee well, and the James. But elaborate on that, because right now the story I'm getting is, um, you know, you grew up fishing smaller impoundments, uh, motor restricted impoundments. You learned a lot about blueback herring and blueback herring kind of style fish behaviors. You you plateaued there and then you went from like little boats to be like, all right, time to try to make the elites. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> well, well so, yeah, so yeah, jumping all over the place, right? So yeah, I did the John Boat stuff for a while um, and obviously could not afford a glass boat because I was young and literally pouring all my money into fishing stuff like tackle and gear and all that stuff and not even thinking about how am I going to do this. And I got, you know, I got the itch. I was like, I want to fish one of these Bassmaster Open. So I fished one in 2014. And it was down in Florida and I it, talk about a debacle. I fell down in the boat during the tournament and broke my wrist during Holy the tournament. Shit, dude. Yeah, yeah. And it was kind of like my fault, but also my boater's fault. He got his power pole hung up on some grass. And then like, I went back there to clear it off and he just like launched it off pad. Once I got the power poles to start coming up, and I fell down and broke my wrist anyways. So disaster tournament. Like I was like, maybe this is not what I thought it was. It just didn't, wasn't a good tournament so then i two years later i get the itch i'm still fishing john boat stuff in between that just you know still trying to sharpen the skills and i went back down in 2016 to just i gotta do this i want to go back and fish these open so i signed up for all three at the time they were doing three i think for the division and um it, <laughs> drove down there no practice got a good boat draw actually um first day this, so i won the tournament legitimately because of fog delay it's crazy to think about um mm. thinking about it but yeah so i drew he's on the elite series now but his name's Derek hudnall he fishes the elite series um he's with missile and a couple other companies but um so i drew Derek the first day and bad fog delay he he was going to run this is at toho so it's at uh kissimmee chain and he's going to run to kissimmee we're going to lock through and go down and fish the lower chain so really bad fog he said well We'll wait for the fog. They finally let us go. It's still foggy. He said, I've got one spot not far from takeoff. We'll stop. I caught a big one there in practice. I said, okay, well, no problem. We stopped the boat, sets the boat down, and he starts fishing this little grass patch, and I'm just casting a worm out behind the boat, and uh, I hit a piece of shell out there, and I caught a four-pounder. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Dude, I, and Derek will tell you if he ever sees this interview, I whacked on them. I hit that shell every cast for the next hour or two and blasted them. Um, and should have should have caught a bigger bag than I did. Uh, Derek actually had his hand on a probably five and a half or six pounder that that came off. But I was literally just like trying to call fours and fives in the bottom of the boat. I think I had I don't I forget what I had that day, but it was an incredible day for the open. I think I was in second place after the first day and um, drew another local Terry Seagraves the next day, um, had a tougher day, but caught three, luckily salvage made just barely made it into the final day, um, in seventh place. So I was just happy to be there. I wasn't even really, even the thought of winning was not crossing my head, drew another local Cody Detweiler who was on him. He lived there. His dad at the time, they owned the Marina there at big Toho. Um, and I didn't even know that at the time I was just like, okay, cool. I'm here. And, Cody ran it. We ran down the Kissimmee and blast. He blasted him and I caught him. He ended up losing by an ounce. Uh, poor Cody almost went to the Bassmaster Classic. Mm. Lost yeah, it was Rudolph. tough. I, I, I feel for him to this day. Um, but I ended up catching, I forget, I had like nine pounds or something the last day on three fish and was sitting there and I'm like, I was on the hot seat and I'm like, holy cow, like, what am I doing on the hot seat? And I'm like watching people come down. They were doing the weigh ins at Bass Pro at the time. And, uh, by the time I seen like the last boat come around the corner, I was like, Oh, I already talked to that guy backstage. He didn't even have any bass. I was like, Oh, and then it set in. I was like, I'm going to win. <laughs> uh, and yeah, that's, so that's a hell of a feeling. Win. That sucks. Yeah, yeah, the hot so, seat sucks, dude. It's, yeah. it's fun, but it sucks. <laughs> yeah. I got to sit on the hot seat last weekend too. That was my first time since the open. Uh, but yeah, so I, at the time, like, you know, I loved bass fishing, but like, it wasn't, you know, like it was my passion. Like I said, I wanted to do it and I wanted to go pro, but the, the path didn't look realistic at all. And, and then when I won that, I'm like, oh, 
this might, this must be fate. Um, and it wasn't right. It wasn't, that wasn't the end all be all, but it was cool. So I want to glad I want to, at the time it was a nitro Z 18 with a one fifty on it. Um, so it was either like sell the boat or keep the boat. And I was like, dude, I, I'm keeping the boat hundred percent paying the taxes on it. So I kept the boat, um, fished the next two opens. I think in that went to Smith Lake, um, in Alabama was the one after that, um, had a incredible tournament fish with, uh, Brad Knight right after he won the Forest Wood Cup. That was like right after he won it. Um, and that was an awesome tournament. I, we whacked a bunch of spotted bass and stuff in that one. Um, well, yeah, let's, like, let, let's, let's, let's kind of really dissect this then. So you go from behind, b- back, blah, 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 blah. I can speak English, the back of the boat to the front and you're in another so, state. Yeah. So, well, so this is one. So I won the, the Bassmaster Open for, as a non-boater. That, I finished that season out as a non-boater. So okay, I, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, gotcha. so I finished that season. So the next tournament in that season was at Smith Lake. Caught him pretty good. I think I cashed a check in that one. And then I forget where the last one was. Um, I don't remember. I think it might Southern have been Division? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, it it's was Southern Chick- Division. Probably Chickamauga yeah. or Gaston. Yeah, it might have been Chickamauga. We, I went to Chickamauga like three times. Because the following year, so I won the boat. And I had some, at that point, I started working for my new job and i had a little bit of sponsorship backing so he was like yeah like you know let's let's try to see if you can chase the open stream right and you could qualify for the elites through the three divisions that back then so the following year got my boat that i won you know and picked up through bass pro and i went and fished the pro side the following season uh and that was chickamauga um where'd we go chickamauga and we finished it out at Smith Lake in in the fall. I remember that one. I'm trying to remember what the other one was. Um, oh, it was Florida. I'm sorry. So it was Florida, then Chickamauga. So we went to the Harris Chain, and then Chickamauga, and then we went to the Smith Lake the following year. I did terrible at all three of those tournaments. Uh, I did terrible. And that was like the realization where I was telling you off camera, where like it's one thing to be able to catch bass. And I felt like I did catch bass in practice in all those events, but I did not like finding a tournament winning caliber of fish that's going to last you a multi-day event in the opens is incredibly well, hard. <laughs> I, I really want to talk about that because it's such a weird sport when you go from all these single days to a multi-day event. And, and the way I describe it is I, I personally, I, I don't like single day events in general. Cause I feel like if it's a base, if you're playing baseball, Baseball is supposed to be nine innings. You're not yeah. playing four innings or half. And because you really want to see that's that's the point of the purity of the game. The purity of the sport is you have multiple days that you're going to get punched in the face, make a change. Um, you can always run into five. And, and it's not to poo poo guys that do no legs, but you can run into five one time. But uh, you see so many guys, I'll crack a great bag day one, and then they don't even make the top 50. So it, yeah, it is. I've done, that. I've done that in the opens. Look, I've done that. I know exactly what you're saying right there. But how do you practice for it? Because you're right. I could go fish a like a BFL, for example, and learn or a local club and learn a one day event, how to practice for a one day event. The only way you can really learn how to practice for a multi day event is either you fish college to where and you're good enough to always make the regionals and stuff there where there are three days or you pay the money to do opens or the Toyota series. Yeah, there's not a lot of like there isn't a lot of multi day events really around right i mean it's just no. hard um it's hard logistics you know the, the midweek if you know especially anything over two days like a saturday and sunday right unless you're going and committing to do like a toyota or um you know something big like that and it's and that's really where i that's why i tried to fish so many of them because i wanted to fish and i fished as a non-boater in a lot of events too i sprinkled in between all that so even after winning and going and fishing the pro division the following year and doing terrible, I thought to myself, well, I'm going to fish in the, the glass boat around the house, try to get better. But I still want to do the non-boater stuff because I want to learn. I, I And I that's really what you're doing as a non-boater. Winning was cool. Like, winning was awesome. Don't get me wrong. But, like, I've drawn and fished with a lot of great anglers. Like, like off the top of my head, I've fished with Scott Martin in Florida. I've fished with Brian Latimer. I've fished with Brad Knight. I've fished with Zach Burge. Wow. I've fished with... Um, who else have I fished with? That's just been awesome. Like I said, Derek Hudnall, who's on the Elite Series. My buddy Tyler Carrier, who fished on the Elite Series for a little while, fished with him. That's a lot of education. Yeah. So, and you just learn a ton. And local people, I fished with a couple of locals at Chickamauga, uh, a couple of people, you know, ledge fishing specialists on Chickamauga. Um, who else have I fished with that's been really, really good? 
I'm probably leaving some great anglers out, but I mean, I got to fish with Scott Martin and fish behind him and watch him dissect pads. I got to fish with, like I said, Brad Knight. Oh, the best one, I, best angler I've ever shared the boat with by far, Buddy Gross. I got to watch Buddy Gross dissect the Harris chain. And it absolutely, like I, that was the only time I can remember ever once in the opens where I was more concerned about watching him than I was about fish. I literally was watching him, just watching him fish. And I'm like, hold on, you're, you're in contention to win this. You should just make some casts. Cause buddy gross was absolutely unreal fishing grass with the, at the time this was pre this mine. So this was 2019. So there was live scope. Live scope hadn't took like complete hold like it had now, but he was using 360. And I mean, he was counting, He'd be like, all right, there's seven bass in this hole. And he would like, I, he'd be like, you can't come on the front deck, but stand on the back deck and watch. And he'd be like, you see it? And they'd be like seven that bat, And he'd catch all seven of them. I swear. I'd never seen anything like it. And I just was just standing there like, all right, well, <laughs> it was incredible. Um, so, yeah, just getting to see stuff like that, watching people fish and knowing how they do it, like shorten the, the learning curve big time for me. So I knew what not to do, what I should be doing, kind of you know, mechanics wise, was I on par? Like, you know, can I cast, can I, and then obviously finding them is the big thing. Like we talked about and I, that just kind of came with a fish in those tournaments and kind of sitting with those guys and kind of watching the, the areas, like seeing how they're dissecting these, these bodies of water, looking at, okay, we're at Smith Lake at the time of year. What are we doing? Like I got to watch Brad Knight pull in and he's like, yeah, I'm gonna go catch this one off the bed. And it's in like 12 foot of water. I'm like, you looking at it? Like, no, nah, I just know it's there. He's like, I caught it twice in practice. And he goes in there and he, I mean, makes three casts on it, catches it. It's a 412 spot. I'm like, okay, this is what we're doing today. I mean, just absolutely murdered me from the front that day. So like you get to see people who are truly dialed and know what they're doing. And like, I got to do a lot of it pre live scope too. So that was cool. You know, people watching people graph out on the ledges and like turn around, spin, wait for the current nose up, throw a swim bait at them, catch one first cast. You're like, this is incredible. Like just things that you wouldn't get to do back home, you know, and things that like, I have a lot of shallow water experience where I'm from here. Um, but that deep water game, I got to learn a lot of that. Um, so that's kind of polished me up a little bit. And I've tried to been, you know, learn and get better at that too and add that into the arsenal. But it's just, yeah, it's a, it's been a major learning experience. The opens have been great. And then, you know, just competing back home on different places every weekend, trying to get better has kind of been my deal. Two things with that. One is what was the biggest thing that was the learning curve for practicing for multi-day events? And then the second part of that question, uh, maybe this will tie in is how important is it to have some kind of history and knowledge of the place you're going I, I get this question um, a lot um, on the show where it's like, well, how do I fish a, how, how do I do good on a body of water I've never been to before? And, and my, after doing this show for so long, it's like, you can't, you're going to suck. Cause but, uh, you know, if, you know if, if honestly, your, I would disagree with that. I would say that my best, it. a lot of my best tournaments are in places. I don't like, like we talked about kind of earlier where you regress and you spot fish. I fish yeah. a lot better when I just show up and fish, like, which is why, like, I, I know it sounds crazy. Like prac I said, like you need to practice and learn to find fish, but it's also, I think that's the mentality. If you're fishing for a multi-day event, you need to learn how to practice. You can't just show up and learn a uh, lake. You might just, you might strike gold if, you know, like, like I went to Chickamauga and kind of landed on the first day by sheer luck, but it, you, you, I'm trying where I, where I was trying to, you do need to practice for multi-day events. But for me, a lot of times I do not practice at all for a lot of the stuff I do around the house. I show up and I fish fresh because I want to read the water that when I get there, I don't want to practice at all. I show True. up and I just, I just shoot. And so like the lakes around here, I don't practice for Kerr. I did practice for the elite 70. Um, and it, it did pay off. Right. But I try but, not to, practice. Yeah, that's my, but thing. I guess my it, point is instinct. You have an instinct for these lakes because you've been there before. So example is I, I fished the title Potomac since I was 14. Like I don't have to practice. And so am I fishing the moment? Yeah, but I still know the stupid place because I fished it since I'm 14. So I'm not blind. And I guess that's my point is if you've quite literally never been to Kerr before, that's different type of showing up versus like I fished a couple times at Kerr and I'm not going to practice, but I have some kind of, and, and I guess I should have clarified that. Um, yeah. And the reason I say that is there are so many professionals at the elites where, I mean, yeah, they've gone to the James River and like, you know, like Champlain for the Northern Division, what, 58 years in a row. So yeah. 
you get pretty good at the James River at that time of year, every single year for a pass open. Yeah, yeah, um, for sure. For sure. I mean, that's kind of like the BFLs, man. I mean, the BFLs that's true. Do the same schedule every year. You always know Kerr is going to be like five times between two divisions. That's just, it seems like how, like, I don't know. Like, and I love Kerr. Ooh. Don't get me wrong. Like having just won the biggest tournament of my life on Kerr. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not a lo- I'm not a local on Kerr. I fish it once or twice a year, you know, uh, when I have to, like, and like, I just got lucky. I don't know the lake any better. I'm not a Tyler Trent. Like, I'm not that guy. He's an absolute animal down there. Um, I'm just not a low, but I, that's my kind of, I'm like a, I'm kind of like a transient man. Cause like, I can't like, I make, I, I do well on the little lakes around here, but I don't technically have a body of water. I can call a home body of water that I like quote unquote, you know, live on and fish on constantly. So like the James, I fish a lot, I guess you consider that my home water, but I still don't even really consider that my home water, you know? Um, so I just kind of, I don't spend a ton of time on any single body of water so that I'm so locked in that I'm, you know, and it you yeah, know, I just kind of bounce around, and I maybe that hurts me. I don't know if that's. I don't good, think so. I, I think don't it's know. Good then. Yeah, I try to stay fresh because, like, I don't know. Like I said, I know Kerr. I know kind of like what I'm looking for, especially this time of the year, which is kind of what played into my favor on this win. But um, like, I'm not the type of dude that's going to catch him on Kerr 24 seven because I just don't. I don't have. I don't have the deep game on Kerr figured out yet, um, and a lot of those guys do. Um, you know, I fortunately. Mean, well, yeah, I mean, we're going to get into the Kerr tournament, believe that. But the thing you, I just want to make sure I hit on that to make sure, you know, you take your bow here where I, I do think mixing it up is very important because, again, you know, I've had enough people on this show. There are so many people that get just so good at one place and that you get a subconscious instinct to your fishing. And if all you do is fish dirty water that's six inches deep, that's it for 15 to 20 years it would be hard for you to go to the St. Lawrence. It'll be hard for you to go to Lake Murray in the Carolinas because your instincts are going to tell you that this feels uncomfortable. You know, right. even if you try to read the bass, even if you try to do everything to get comfortable with it, if you've never fished 30 feet of water, you're not going to feel comfortable in it. And so I do think you should applaud yourself that because you've bounced around so much, it's going to be hard for you to get hit with that curveball where you just feel weird doing something. Yeah, no, I feel pretty, I mean, like I definitely feel well pretty well-rounded as an angler at this point. Like, I feel like you could drop me in Oneida or in the Great Lakes and catch smallmouth. I, I, am I going to win? Probably not, but I think I could find some smallmouth. And same thing with largemouth. Drop me at Lay Lake or in Florida or in Texas. I feel confident, like, I could figure it out even for it. Even if you took the live scope off the boat, I think I could pretty much figure it out just through just bass fishing and knowing what bass do and having it, like, just those, like, five lakes. I mean, they're just not, they're not titles, so I don't have that, but I do have the James. So I've learned that, but those five lakes with the reservoir, with the standing timber and the schooling fish and the bluebacks and you know, incredible spawning opportunities like site fishing. I've done a lot of good site fishing here. So, I mean, just they, the, the fish in our lakes suspend a lot. So I've figured out how to catch suspending fish a lot. So you get, which applies everywhere you go. Cause what do fish yeah. do? anywhere you go and they get in a negative mood, they suspend, which is, I think why the, you know, I've been so fond of a jerk bait my whole life. So there's just, yeah, I mean, they've been a perfect training ground, but not like they've definitely prepared me. I definitely, I definitely am very thankful for that, but you know, it's, yeah, I, I was regressing. So I jumped around a little bit. And, and getting, and before we, uh, everyone get locked into the Kerr tournament, um, <laughs> You started to touch on it. I really want to make sure we hit this home. When you're fishing a multi-day event and you're practicing, the way you're talking about practice is very unique. And I think this is, I'm assuming what throws so many people that are really good at one-day events, but then you throw them in the Opens or the Toyota Series and they they don't live up to the expectations they have for themselves. Could, could you kind of add to that a little bit more about what you mean by practicing is a little different? Yeah, it's, it's for like the multi-day stuff. Yeah, it's yeah. different. It's, it's just you have to... You have to find uh, groups of fish. You can't rely on one group of fish. You can't rely on one pattern. Like you can't go into an open saying, I'm going to catch them on a buzz bait. You're going to lose. You know what I mean? Unless God really wants you to win that tournament, then maybe you would. <laughs> but, you know, you just like, and so this, uh, uh, you know, kind of when we touch on the Kerr tournament, I'll touch on some more, but you just can't, you got to have options, you know? So you got to give yourself, I, like if, in a, B, C, D type options, finding different groups of fish, fishing your strengths and confidences, 
Um, like for me, it's, you know, it's, you, you've got to be, it, it, well, I think when I first did it, I didn't cover enough water. That was the first thing you've got. I mean, those guys in the open, like in the elite series, when they go to a place and they got three days to break a place down, dude, they are covering an incredible amount of water. Uh, really? Uh, which is why, yeah. Which is why they're using the live scopes on the rear of the boat now and stuff. It, it's just the amount of water they're breaking down, graphing and eliminating that you're eliminating water is what you're doing and finding groups of fish. Um, and that's, extremely difficult to do and it changes body a water to body water if you're good to a place like florida you've got to be prepared to fish in a crowd um i like the first time i went to florida i was like oh mm -hmm. i'm not gonna do that i'm gonna find a hidden gem well <laughs> how'd that work yeah let me tell you how that went down uh, it didn't go very well and i realized like if you see a hundred boats in a 50 acre section of the lake there's a reason for that you might want to just roll in there and be the best angler you can be like the Potomac, right? I mean, we know yeah. how the Potomac fish is similar to that too. Um, so you just got to know, like, and you learn that, right? Make boneheaded decisions on, oh, I'm going to be mm -hmm. stubborn. Well, sometimes you can't be stubborn. Sometimes you have to know. <laughs> no, nope. just got to manage one in 30 years. I'm going to win there. <laughs> yeah, you got to be the best angler in the crowd sometimes. Yeah. And I don't like fishing in a crowd if I can absolutely help it. That's like the last case scenario. But there are times where you have to do that. Um, and then you just do that through, you know, practicing and experience and, and going through that, but finding them in a multi-day event is, is the Holy grail. If you can find them in a multi-day event for an open or something like that, then you're going to be doing a whole lot of podcasts like this. Cause you're going to be winning a lot of tournaments. Uh, you, and I'm still, is it, is it I'm sorry, really you, size dependent? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish thought. Well, uh, you're fine. What were you saying? I was saying that, is it size dependent? So example is, do you break down the lake the same way at Lake Anna, which is 9,000 acres versus Toledo Bend, which is 100,000 to where, okay, Lake Anna, you can, or, or High Rock, you can run literally the whole lake fairly efficiently. So I can have a pattern down here, pattern up there, but yeah, Toledo Bend is an ocean. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely lake dependent and, and you definitely have to know it's time management. It's high percentage. How many high percentage casts can I make in a day to give myself a chance to win? I mean, that's what it boils down to, right? How many high percentage cast can i make in a day's time and win and time management is a critical part of that so me coming from the james we're making long runs to the chick or even further long runs are a part of what we do time management is a, and running tide right and same deal on the potomac um so that i think has helped me and so just just knowing like what do i got to do to make a lot of high percentage casts to you know how can I not wait? And I, and I, I've having fished the opens a lot as a non-boater, I can tell you I've been with guys who don't practice well and have, you know, and I get stuck with guys who are just out there fishing the dead sea and they're just, just one lob cast, you know, super inefficient. And it's, you know, just like in, like in business, like I, efficiency is everything. So if I'm making lots of efficient on target casts in high percentage places, but my numbers go up on on winning right I mean, so that's what i try to do is find lots of fish in certain stretches and then try to dial them in and know that i can run that and be efficient throughout my day i try not to like it cur if i was you know running from okanichi going to nut bush and i'm trying to catch him down there and stuff like i knew coming into that tournament like that was not going to be time management was going to be key because yeah. there's gonna be a lot of boats on the lake um you know, so that's why I always try to run different scenarios through my head when I, before I ever launch. And, and I'm yeah. really glad you said that. I really am glad because there's so many people that listen to Brian Thrift's mentality of, of okay, I'm going to hit all these docks, but I kept, I kept coming back to this. That strategy works if you have the places to go and you, you know, know that, that they're there. Yeah, you got to know they're not. Exactly. And it's like, if you don't stay in that Creek and figure that Creek out, because yes, a hundred percent, that strategy works, but you need to know what the hell you're doing. Not just like, I'm just going to haul ass across this lake and we're going to let yeah. God be my witness. Like, it's just, so I'm a, I'm a big proponent for fishing fast, slow. Like, and I've heard that a couple people say that, but that's what I do. I'm very like, I, I typically don't jump around a ton. Like if I've, if I'm at a Toledo bin, I'm going to find a Creek arm that I think I can win in. And I'm going to, figure out how to make that creek arm work and or, or two creek arms adjacent to each other but i'm not going to find a creek arm and i'm going to have a, i got an up lake and a down lake pattern that's typically not the type of angler i am i'm typically not one of two extremes i'm trying to find two or three patterns that are that play off of each other and that i can efficiently 
run, uh, whether it's if I'm deciding on the mid lake, whether I've got a small top water pattern and something else go along with it. I try to make stuff that that complements itself well instead of going the drastic of two extremes and hoping for lightning every time I go fishing. You know what I mean? I don't want to do that. How if much of that? With that fishing that creek pattern, and I think this is fascinating, especially with the rise of these stud Japanese anglers. And again, I'll bring this back to baseball, where you saw the, the their style of baseball, and when they came over here, it blew people out of the way of how they pitch backwards, their hitting style. And you see these these Japanese anglers are like, "Uh, where's the launch ramp? It's there. I'm going to fish this creek here for four days straight." And everyone's like, "Oh, everyone knows that hole." Well, they still finish a top ten there, even though it's an obvious place. Well, they, do we just? Yeah, they I was going to say. Like, do we as Americans just outthink the room? Like, why the hell is that style yeah. work? Yeah. So, hundred percent. Like, I would say that. Um, I I don't know that I'm not going to just throw percentages. Out. I know a lot of anglers that I know personally that would be a lot better if they stopped overthinking it. Because, like I, I told you earlier, it's bass fishing is this. The lures we all buy the same lures. We all have access to the same equipment. We all have access to pretty much the same stuff for the most part, Google earth pro the same, you know, the same software to find fish, this, like everything pretty much. We all can have live scope now. So like what separates us between the results is in making good decisions and finding winning groups of fish. Like that's what it comes down to catching them, you know, is, is the easy part really. That's the way I see it. And I know a lot of the people I talk with in the opens and stuff, they feel the same way. It's like, it's, you have to find fish and you know, everyone can catch them once you get to a certain level, but can you find them consistently? Can you prevent the duds? Can you, you know, instead of, I, I don't ever want to be the guy where like I'm winning a tournament a year, but I'm finishing a hundredth in AOI. That's not the type of angler I am. I, I don't swing for home runs a lot, but I am always trying to catch the five biggest bass I can if, and try to win. But it, I don't like, uh, I don't know if that may, came out right, but I, no, I just, no, I want to be consistent, yeah. you know, and I want to make sure I'm making high percentage casts with good stuff and I'm not doing, you know, making, you know, throwing giant swim baits, like, you know, in, in critical tournament situations, unless it's really, unless I already got 25 pounds on the well, you know what I mean? It's just, but you'd be surprised at how many people I see that just like, just they overthink it like they, it's yeah mm. or they think their color of their worm is why they caught 20 for like i don't think that like i think color is very small on the scale of why we get bit you know or things like that like i have friends who are super over analytical of certain things and that's great in in, in some regard but like 90 percent i would say 95 percent of the reason you get bit is because of you put it on them and you surprise them and you caught them, right? Like it's not, I mean, I don't even think they like a lot of bites aren't even feeding bites. It's a reaction bite. Like, I mean, it's mm -hmm. you, you surprise them, they, especially in shallow water, you surprise them, they turn around, they eat it because they don't have hands. They just, <laughs> they, they do it. Right. So it's, uh, it's, I just think we overthink it sometimes. And if you just make good casts in high percentage areas with the right bait, it's not that, I don't want to say it's not that difficult, you know, but it's, but you just, it takes years of knowing the right situation, the right bait, the right everything to make it work. And it still doesn't always work, right? Because you can dud. Like like I won last weekend and then I went this past Saturday trying to, you know, oh, I'm going to go catch him to the James. I didn't even catch a limit at the James. Like, and I like it. it so that just, it's a humbling sport, right? Because you feel like one, one second I'm on top of the world. I feel like the best bass fisherman and a genius. And then the next weekend I go and I don't even catch a limit. You know, so that just goes to show you how bass fishing is. Sometimes you can do everything right and think you're doing the right thing. And sometimes you just don't catch them and that's fishing sometimes, but you know, nine times out of 10, if you showed up and made that, I, I feel like I would have caught them. It was just a bad day of fishing. Right. But, um, I just think we overthink it sometimes. It's just, they're fish, man. Like, yeah. you know, I know we, we really, we really do. I mean, you're right. We, we really do. And like, I, I, I hang out with a bunch of friends that go fish the BFLs and we were at Smith and we're, I forget what Creek we're in cause we were drinking a lot. And, uh, but it was where the house was at. And one of the guys like was done for the day and he let me have his boat. So I was like, I was going to fuck around in this Creek with the trolling motor. And he's like, well, you can use the big motor. I was like, no, nah, I'm just going to say like, this Creek's my lake. I'm going to fish it. And I ended up catching like six keepers out of there. They weren't the biggest. And then I came back and he's like, oh, I didn't catch anything out of there. It's like, well, how many casts did you make? Cause I just went around in a circle until I figured it out. And that really made me think on the drive home. Like 
Nolan Miner I had on the show who, who's fished the opens the kayak, he had such a big you know, it just yeah, it blew my mind when he said this. Like when he got a kayak with the live scope, he's like, I didn't realize how many fish we fish over when we have a 250 on the back of the boat. Yeah. And that just blew my mind and my concept of fishing. It's like, yeah, how many creeks do we say suck? But there are five keepers in there. Dude, every one of them, every creek you go in's got it got fish. And you used to get yeah, like live scope will show you now, like they're there and you catch yeah. I've thrown it enough big fish, like big dots out in the middle of the creek and caught big bass already now to know like, oh, this is what's been going on for years. What you're seeing now, all the pelagic fish that I was catching for years, pre-live scope in these little lakes around here. Uh, now I see them with live scope. I'm like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. I know what you're doing now. But at the time, you know, pre-live scope, like, can you, like, I felt really dumb you know, six or seven years ago, fishing around in the middle of the lake. Cause I would fish, it'd be middle of the summer and I'd just be throwing a big giant fluke out in the middle of the lake. And every hour or hour and a half, a five pounder would shoot up out of the bottom and he didn't go back down and you'd have to be ready for it when it happened, but it would happen consistently about every hour. But it was just like, I knew they were out there. I just didn't know where. And now I know they were in little Creek channel bins and stuff and real high percentage areas when a school of blue back came by the, the, the tree too close, boom, you got eight, you know, and if you put the fluke in the right position, you got eight. And so, um, just weird stuff like that, you know, you wouldn't, I mean, now they're doing it like, you know, kids are coming in and they just see live scope and they throw those fish and they eat. And we, you know, for a decade or more of my fishing career. And I know why old guys are angry. They fish for 30 years and now guys are just coming in and just throwing a jig head minnow out in the middle of the Creek and catching, you know, eight pounders and 10 pounders and stuff. And I've done a little bit of that too. I've been, I've been dabbling with the jig head minnow caught quite a few fish on it. It does work. I, I don't like doing <laughs> you say that so depressingly. <laughs> yeah, I do look like I like look. I I love the live scope technology. I've been using it since 2019 and um, I do love it, but I do think it it takes away from what we're you know it takes a little bit of luster off of it. You know, I, people it always what captures the headlines. It's always like you know the shark attacks, things like that. Always capture the headlines of like okay, it, it's the guy that's like literally tickling them with the the fluke minnow and, and catching thirty pounds. And I really feel like that doesn't give it a, it's not the whole picture with live scope. And I, I've had it where I've really focused hard for about 13 months learning it. And, and what came to my mind is it's your ability to cycle through information quickly and make decisions. I have yeah. caught fish 100% that I saw, I scoped. I've had tournaments I did really good in. I never saw one take the bait, but I made decisions really quick based on the information. Like this place is dead. I'm gone. They're not yeah, reacting you, to this bait. I need to make a change. You can see, yeah, you pull into a creek and you see bait. Like, oh, okay, well, there's something to this, you know. It's pull a new yeah. creek, you don't see bait. Fish for 30 minutes, you don't get a bite. Oh, okay, well, that's confirmation of thought, right? Like, well, the live yep. scope's like, you know, I, I, there ain't nothing around here. It's the Dead Sea. And it, like you do, like I, you catch big ones with it. I mean, you catch fish you never see. So, like, my, here's a perfect live scope story. So, uh, fishing the Perquimans River, which this is down south of me. This is in the Albemarle Sound. If you, um, giants like some of the best fish in, in the country i would bet um right now doesn't it's low key you, you'll hear more about it once uh once bpt hits the show on um here in a few months you'll hear it'll it'll be on the map because guys are going to blast them i actually fish that's where i was fishing sunday it was on the show on and oh, cool giants man but um but anyways fishing on the perquimans which is a tributary off of the album world, and um going down the bank fishing the bank and i tripped and i have a garbage trolling motor i like kind of stumbled a little bit and my trolling motor had spun around like and was facing out into the middle of the river stump about 30 yards away i was like oh cool and i just had a chatterbait in my hand flick this flick the chatterbait over there and the stump moved it was a nine pounder ate my chatterbait yeah and like you know the water down there's like tar black you couldn't even see it like i hooked it i seen the whole stump move i was like oh and it just took off with it and ended up being a nine even um so you just like you i never would have caught that without live scope you know like and on the chowan last year I seen a dot in a, in a cypress tree on the main river. And I was like, Oh, look at this dot through it, through a Texas right over to it. Another nine pounder never would have caught that fish, you know? So there's like, there's inevitable, like you, like it's a, such a powerful technology. I mean, I yeah. you can't deny the importance of it. Like I wouldn't be opposed to them putting limits on it or something to a degree, because I do think it's kind of, 
I don't know, but they don't, it doesn't make them jump in the boat either. I think that's the, the notion that when things you get live scope and you start catching them, like I've had it for four years and I, I've, I've done a whole lot of not catching them versus catching them. And I think that's the, you know, I, old I, people I, I who don't want to do, who have never used it are the loudest people in the room when it comes to it. It's never the people that are using it that are, you know, like I, I can, I've used it a lot. I can say that maybe it's not the best for the sport, but for people who have never used it, making opinions about it, I don't think is good. Like just because they want to be stuck in their way. I, you can't make an informed opinion if you know nothing about it. You know, I, yeah, I, think, I think there's two parts to that. The, 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 the first part there is if there's a learning curve that's been cut down. So if you are a guy that has been on the elites and has fished that for 25 years, you don't have to put in so much work because you know the lakes you're going to go to, you have a generic idea, you're going to be good enough to stay on the elites. This right. technology comes along and a 22 year old can beat the shit out of you a lot of times because they've cut that learning curve down. Yeah. Now, the other part of this is you saw this in baseball with the steroid era. The first few people that early adopt getting juiced up, it made them look so much better than everybody else. It was stupid. But then yeah. once 80% of the field started to juice, everyone just looked the same kind of speak, but the stats were just, were just more gaudy. Exactly. I think right now what you're, yeah, I, I, what you're seeing right now is like, not everyone's good at it yet. And so that's why there's this massive separation in some of these tournaments. I think in another generation or two of anglers, like five to six years, once everyone's good at this, it's not going to be so glaring the separation because yeah. everyone's going to be good at the technology. Yeah, I don't, everyone at the top hasn't fully uh, embraced it. Um, you know, I don't, they, I definitely not everyone's embraced it. People are slowly starting to get on, catch on. I know here local, all my, you know, all the local guys around here, the John Boat Mafia is running live scope. I don't think there's many that ain't running live scope around here. And I'm sure it's the same a lot. Like people have embraced it. Um, I think the old guard of pros that built their, you know, uh, brand in the 90s and the early 2000s, a lot of some of those guys are resistant to it, I think, just because they're the old school jig flippers and they want to be resistant to it, um, which I mean, I guess I can understand. I mean, if you've done things your whole uh, one way your whole life, but like bass fishing is all about adapting, right? I mean, it's you can't just be living in the 90s and expect to compete in 2024. Like, what? It, I mean, you know, you I mean, yes, like you can go old school and still win uh, last weekend, prove that. But you can't like be naive to the fact that technology is here and it's not going to change unless they put a limit on it, in which case then we'll see what happens. Right. But until then you, you got to embrace it. You can't, you can't like, if you're like, you're a salesman, like if you're a professional angler, you know, you're, I mean, you're not making money off tournament. You're getting being paid salaries by these companies. Right. And like, you can't expect to give you these companies your, your all, if you're bad mouth and live scope, every chance you get on a Facebook post or whining or complaining like that doesn't, that's just not like you're a salesman. That's not a good salesman look, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I've always said like you, you're blaming live scope and part of it also should be at the fault of the tournament organizations that scheduled the tournaments to an extent, because it was like back in the day when Kevin Van Dam was winning all the ledge events. If you put stuff at Kentucky Lake during a ledge bite, you know, what's going to happen. Don't be shocked. If yeah. you're going to go to Lake Fork in February, what the hell do you think is going to happen? Like, it, you yeah. you can't, you have some control over adjusting the schedule to give. There was, it was a couple of years ago, like John Cox was kicking ass, uh, you know, on, on Chickamauga, but it was a spawn event and there were some fish shallow. So you could do that. Like, yeah. uh, adjust the schedule a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I don't disagree with that. Like, I, I don't know. We'll see. Like, I mean, we know bass fishing is all about viewership, right? So, like, yeah. if the viewership tanks and, like they, they're going to have a hard choice. Are we going to take bass or elite? They're going to have to say, are we going to reject the sponsorship dollars from these electronics companies? No. So that we can get our, but if they don't have a fan base because of it, eventually who knows, right? I don't know what's going to happen. I do. I do think that they may put limits on. I really think it's going to, they should. Eventually. I think they're going to, I, I mean, it may not outright ban it, but I do think they may put limits on it to a degree, which I mean, every other I mean, sport like, has limits. Yeah. I mean, I agree. At, at, at what point though, like, you know, you see the guys with the, the, you know, the Mac goggles with the, I mean, like that's here. Like, it's not like, Oh, that's going to, no the guys are already doing that. Like, and at what point is it like this? I mean, people are just, it's comical. Are we fishing at that point? You know? So I'm, I love it. I do love the technology, but I'm also not against common sense measures for, um, 
regulating it to a degree, you know what I mean? So that it kind of levels the playing field for all of us. To it, a degree. It, and if it's not that, it's just optics. Like, I'm sorry, like the, the Brian Schmidt thing where it's like he had 37 monitors he at did, his graph. He did that on purpose. Like, I 100% believe he did that for the video. Because if you, uh, I don't know, the yeah. very next day, he didn't have all those graphs on during the tournament. He took off the two side ones and only had two at the console and two up front. So, like, I think he did that just because he knew, like, he's trying to, like, a lot of those guys don't want to do it. I mean, they've voiced those concerns. It's obvious. they, But they're doing it because they want to compete. They want to win. And mm -hmm. then you have a Trey McKinney come in there and dog them. You know, and with limited, I'm not going to say limited funds because I'm sure he has the cap means and capability, but like young dude, you know, clearly not as, like established like some of these other guys with tons of sponsorship backing and stuff comes in, just dogs them with live scope, you know, I mean, because he knows what to do, you know, and yep. that's, I mean, what do you do? I mean, you can't hate a man for being good at his craft, even if he's 20 years you're younger than you. <laughs> You, you can't and it's killed the vanguard of like you have to fish the thing for 30 years and, and that was the thing is like that's how you get good and now it's cut that learning curve down and that scares a lot of people it re yeah. really does but i do think if we if they do put limits on it like we talked about like you're gonna see guys who i mean i i guess you you know they've learned a lot seeing live scope now seeing how fish react and stuff but i do certainly feel like you're the guys who were bass fishing prior to live scope and were winning tournaments prior to live scope are it's just another tool for them, right? I mean, that for me, that's how I viewed it, right? I was winning before live scope, and now I just viewed it as another tool, and it made me a better angler. But it doesn't; it's not going to inherently change the way that I fish if they take it away. I'm still just going to do the same and approach bodies of water and break it down the same way I do. But it might be different for somebody who didn't have that base of fishing knowledge prior to live scope coming out. I don't know if I would see it in a different lens than them or not, or maybe it doesn't matter because they're seeing it live on the screen. And, oh, we took it away. Well, I got four or five years of using it and seeing how fish behave. Maybe that was enough. I don't know. I guess we'll see. Time I think it really is your definition of what the restrictions would be. What, in your mind, yeah. would the restrictions be? I don't, man, I don't know. Um, like one graph, just, like on each like side? Maybe, like, yeah, maybe they, maybe they limit the amount of transducers. Maybe they do go no live scope period. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's just... It's hard I, to believe. I know they're they're trying to form some trails out there that are no live scope only. I don't know that the Elite Series and you know MLF would do it um, just because of the sponsorship. But I mean, honestly, I don't know how much money you know Hummingbird or Lawrence is giving them a year or, or a lot. Like, yeah, I mean, I mean, they're just a big part. They're the backbone of the industry. They really are. So, like, I, I think the idea is quite. Um, it's just regressive to say like we're going to get rid of live scope. You're not going to get rid of live scope, but what you limit is having the cartoonish amount of monitors. Because soon, like we joked at, at Smith Mountain Lake, well, why don't we just take this 50 inch plasma screen and plop it in the front of your boat? Like, because without anything else, is there advantage? Yeah, but it's the optics. Like you are no longer the everyman sport. You are you are worse than PGA golf or equestrian. Like for horses, like my yeah. God, it's insane. Oh yeah, I, and that's an expense. Both of those are ridiculously expensive sports. Yeah, so and yeah. the optics are. Not everyone can do them because it's the rich man's sport. Fishing is becoming that way. And once you lose that, like it's hard to get no, that kind of even, brand back. It's not even becoming that way. It is not. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, well, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, dude, a new bass boat's $100,000. Then $100,000 of, uh, and that was, that's with no electronics. Yep. Well, the IKEA, <laughs> that's not IKEA, the Icon boat is 150. Yeah. It's unreal. Like, I, very fortunate to have got in and get my boat when I did. Um, because man, just the thought of buying a new boat right now or being forced to do that, scary times, scary times. I mean, it's crazy. It seems like just like in the last three or four years, the jumps have been astronomical, like every year. It's like at one point it was 50 or 60. And now it's like, what new 98, that what <laughs> 98,000. What do you mean well, with, with no live scope either? What? <laughs> Yeah, and that was my thing with like um I I did a I had a conversation over in January when when it, I saw some icon prices online and I found on Bass Boat Trader one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, I've seen them. And I, I said like the big thing was like oh that's just that boat. I was like no, it's a precedent. Like once a company breaks that wall, other companies can do it first because they're not the first one. And that's what's scary is like okay, icon just pushed it. Who's the next company? It's like well this one's gonna be one hundred and seventy. This one's one hundred and eighty. And well, I, I don't they, know. They're, they'll price themselves. They're going to find it, right? They're going to find yeah. a market value where they're going to say, okay, our sales are truly declining. They're $100,000 right now because people are still buying them. And there's or like eventually, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see once we hit a plateau and then 
they'll the prices will slowly start to come back down. I know that COVID and the cost of resin and all that stuff and electronics. I mean, none of that like you know trying to do package deals now. Everyone wants you know four graphs and. 360 and live imaging and all that stuff. And they want it as a package deal, but they, I mean, just, yeah, you got to pay to play, I guess, but the, the pay to play part with the inflation in this country right now. And just, man, fishing was expensive beforehand, but like you said, it's almost outrageous now. <laughs> it's, it's gotten pretty crazy. And I feel like I'm really modest in the electronics department on my boat. And like, I, I man, I just can't even imagine. I can't even imagine either. And that's a great, I don't know. Like this will be a conversation we'll be having definitely through this year and years to come. Um, they, uh, and then kind of like throwing this thing back on the tracks with with the tournaments. I mean, we talked about your your upbringing, your roots, and and how you practice and everything. And it's kind of culminated to, and, you know, we're almost there to the Kerr tournament, but you stopped doing the opens and you got to the elites, the elite seventies, the alpha, the alpha core. Uh, how, how did you get involved with them? So I, so I, yeah, so I. I've been trying. So the elite 70 is you have to get in through the lottery. There's a lottery draw associated with that with Steve camp and his team. So I was actually on the lottery for seven years before I got in. Oh. I waited, I waited seven years to get into elite 70 chomping at the bit because obviously I knew how good the anglers were in there. And so last year I finally got drew into the elite 70. Um, and, um, yeah, just got in really, you know, was really excited and knew that it was going to be, you know, something cool and, and finally get to fish against all the hammers. I mean, you got Bassmasters Classic Champions in there, Paraznik's in there. You've got um, like just, I mean, hammers, Cody Pike's in there. There's a lot of great, great regional people in there. And I knew that it was going to be cool to fish against them. So finally got in on the, on the draw after seven years, had a great season last year. We competed for AOI right down to the very end. Um, we were leading AOI with one tournament to go on the James and crap the bed. Um, you know, and that's the teams or single or single. That was the, the teams. That was the that teams. Was teams. Yeah, the, the singles started this year. This year was the inaugural uh, singles. But yeah, team team series last year. I did fish. What was it? The last time we had an open. I, I the last open I fished was on the James in uh, twenty. That was the one that um. Was it Kenta won that? Kenta Camara, I think, won that tournament. It, wasn't there an Italian guy? That, wait, are you talking about Open or Toyota? I'm sorry. Yeah, the Open. No, the Open on oh, the James. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Kenta, yeah. So I fished that one. I finished 16th in that Open. Um, That's a pretty cool screenshot. I beat Iconelli by one spot. So I'll forever get to get get to look back on that picture and see that I finished uh, one spot above a Mike Michael Eleni, or Michael Iconelli on a title fishery at that. So that was cool. But yeah, so that was like my last Open. And I was like, well, once I got you know, realized that the opens really, they made that jump where it was like, you got to fish all nine now and all that stuff. I was like, I, I'm just not financially set up for that right now. So I decided to kind of take a step back, try to fish locally. So last year got into the elite 70 and fished some BFLs like we talked about um, to try and fill some gaps in the schedule. But it was a great year last year for sure. Um, we got to go to the Bassmaster Team Championship because of finishing top three in the points with the elite. 70 so we went down to florida this past december and fished at the harris chain for the, uh, the team championship crap the bed in that one too um just how it is you know uh, i just like it just sometimes it's like that like i said you can i've been to the harris chain now like three times i think you know and like you think like i'd have it figured out by now but man no it's just just this bass fishing it's just always different even when you go to new like that's why it's even when these elite series guys go to the same bodies of water over and over again like yeah some guys always dominate but it, it there is always changes you know every time you go to a body water it's like sometimes they're hot in this creek sometimes they're hot in that creek you know it just it changes and, and that's you just it's hard to beat a local but sometimes you can show up with a fresh set of eyes and find it something off the beaten path and win. But yeah, I'm just going on tangents now, but no, that's a good thing. That's what this show's yeah, all yeah, about. Yeah. I was just, yeah, I was just, you know, we're down the rabbit hole, but yeah, it's so yeah. Got into the elite 70, um, had a great year. And then when they, when we finished that this past year, um, you know, Steve announced that they were starting the alpha series single and I'm all for, you know, I was like, Oh, better payouts, more money closer to home. And great competition. I'm all for it. 
Um, so we got the elite 70 guys, the team guys got first shot and then they opened it up to the public and we filled up with hours, I think. I mean, it didn't take long to fill up. Um, and but, even though it's in the name, just to confirm it is 70, uh, individuals. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, so it was, it was targeted at being 70. It's actually, I think that we, we had 84 people sign up for the alpha. Oh. I think some people had to drop because of conflicts and some, uh, some other stuff. So I think we're, I, I think we have 73 or 76. I can't remember. I know the elite, the team series, I think we had 76 last year. It, it's in the 70s pretty much uh, for the most part. It's not right dead on 70, but it's in the 70s pretty much for, I think, both the team and the alpha. That's freaking awesome. That's really cool. So, I mean, it really, you got set up here. We're at this moment, March, Bugs Island. Some yeah. people love it. Some people think it's a piece of shit lake that needs to be filled in. <laughs> What was your thoughts going into a March tournament at Bugs? Because like you said, you don't want to necessarily practice, but you do have history there. Yeah, I had. Yeah, I've had some history there for sure. I I, I fish there like I normally it's the tail of two extremes. So I fish there early in March when it's blowing 45, it seems like in the lakes, 10 footers um, or September when it's terrible. Uh, it just seems like classics are in September and then you get early and you get late. You never get like kind of that in between like the open, I think came last year in May and that was a kind of cool time The that's a good time. It's at Kerr too. But so coming into it, I was thinking, man, I hope they're shallow. Um, and I, against my better judgment, I actually f did fish the two weekends prior to that up there. Why? Um, just because I wanted to know what was going on. I wanted water temp. I, I kind of wanted to just check and I did terrible. So the, I don't, I, yeah, I did absolutely terrible. The first, the two weeks prior to the tournament I fished, I did, um, I think I caught five. I caught them up shallow because I, I fished the mid lake area of the lake, which I kind of had, which is where I was thinking in my head where I wanted to fish. I kind of wanted to check watercolor. The whole lake was stained for weeks leading up to the event. And like I say, stained like, mud like it was muddy all the way down to halfway down nutbush even i mean it was there was a lot of color in the lake so i fished this the the two weeks prior terrible week prior i was driving down there and i was like i'm gonna i was driving to practice and i was like i'm i'm looking and i seen there was a cat trail thing i was like oh there's a cat today out of fleming town so i was like well i'm going there anyways i might as well jump in a tournament i caught like two fish in the tournament i shouldn't have done that it was a waste of whatever you know but i was like i'm going down there i'm gonna practice so and they put in down at the lower end and i seen how clear it was down at the lower end and then you'd come out of nutbush and get halfway up and it turned into solid mud again and i was like okay this is going to make things interesting but it wasn't good leading into it i was thinking man this is not going to be fun and then luckily the week of the tournament we had hot weather um that whole week pretty much and i think that stain just heated up so when we came into the tournament so our our lead up is is you're off limits monday through thursday for the tournament so you can practice the weekend before but you can't be on the body of water where we're on monday through thursday you get an official practice day on friday so that's kind of how the Elite 70 Alpha and the team works. So we got, I practiced the weekend before, terrible. Friday in practice, unreal. Everywhere you went in the lake, they're just biting everywhere. And I'm thinking to myself, like, this is not good. Like, they cannot, because I, in my head, I'm like, all right, they're not going to bite this good two days in a row at Kerr. They're just not, I know. But it was like every single place I went, it just, you pull in there, pick up any rod, go five yards, catch one. Yeah, I had nine rods on the deck. I caught a fish on all nine rods, every one of them. And I was like, this is, I don't know if this is good or bad. Um, and everybody that I had, there was a house with four of us staying that were all competing in the tournament. Everybody whacked them it, you mm. know, once we got back that night. But like I knew in my head, I'm like, you know, they're like the rain's coming. It was going to, it rained torrentially. It got cold that night of the tournament. So like very warm the whole week leading up to the tournament, day of the tournament torrential rain of course it would be it's tournament day why wouldn't it be um so like knowing in that in my head like i was i was kind of just checking different spots in practice like i i want to get ahead of myself but the reason i ended up winning was because of some plan b stuff that's truly why i won the well, tournament 
Um, let's let's backtrack then because you said some interesting things. And, and so before, I want to make sure for everyone that that really doesn't know. I know there are some people that that are are new to just fishing this area. You know, Kerr is is absolutely massive, one of the biggest lakes we got. And so when you say like mid lake, would that be like the grassy creek area would be considered mid um, and, and nut bush down is lower yeah so i would say what i consider mid would be from yeah maybe say say grassy ish area to like not even eastland because eastland's too far down but like like if you makes the turn you got grassy and then you have like panhandle and ruts and then you got rushing creek and i think the next one down is mill creek like i would say like that little stretch to mill creek and kind of around not where you're approaching back through eastland that was kind of the stretch coming into it that i focused on from grassy to and with that in mind that's a shit ton big, of water you're it's trying a big to area down. Yeah, yeah it's a big area for sure it's not small so if that goes to tell you how i every pocket i pulled in go i caught one everyone that's insane it, yeah, and it, but it was everybody. It wasn't just me, and it just told me like, yes, the fish are up. Then they are dirt shallow because there was a lot of stain in the water. I mean, you had six inches of is maybe. I mean, going maybe. back to your mind, then you go back to the house. Everyone's catching them shallow. The way your tone was with that—that's not what you almost wanted to hear. Well, yeah, I didn't want to hear that everybody was whacking them. I mean, that didn't make me feel good because I knew, like, I'm like, oh. Like, cause you know, you just get that feeling when you're out there, you're like, oh, this isn't, there's nothing secret here. I wasn't doing anything secret. Um, you it's know, one of those power, deals. Yeah. Just power fishing, spring power fishing. And I knew it was going to be, everyone was going to catch them. I just felt like, yes, everyone's going to catch them. I just got to catch them better. So I got to find some off the beaten path stuff. And I felt like, I felt yeah. like I found a couple of good, like I caught two big ones late in the day on Friday. And I felt like, oh, this is going to be the deal. Like, this is going to be my pocket. This little stretch of these little main late divots. And I wasn't focusing on creek arms. I was trying not to focus on creek arms because they were getting tons of pressure. And I knew that that was going to be, it was going to be hard to get, like, to fish some of the good stretches. Like, even in, like, Grassy and some of those other places, which are historically great creeks like i just didn't want to fish around a ton of people so i tried to focus on if you're looking on picture like the stretch from like grassy to up to you know up to ruds and stuff like there's little small bowl pockets off of those stretches and that's kind of what i was focusing on because i knew that it had good access to deep main lake water and a lot of them had blown in wood on them like from you know kerr is a flood control lake so it goes up and down a lot throughout the years and there's trash you know, gets deposited, trees get deposited all over the place. And I, leading up to that event, we actually, I'm, I don't know if you know, but like we had tons of rain in the weeks leading up to that. So the lake actually was down at 298. Then it shot up to 303 the weekend and really the week of the tournament. And then they started sucking it back down to, right leading up to the tournament. They were pulling water, I mean, right up till Friday. And then the, the lake kind of finally stabilized at 301. But um, Did you know it was going to stabilize at 301? I didn't know it was, we no, I didn't know it was going to stabilize. I didn't know what they were going to do. I, I just assumed worst case scenario, they were going to suck it all back down because they don't ever let the water stay up there anymore. I, I don't know why, you know, historically, I don't know. I'm sure you've heard, but like when the water gets in the bushes and stuff occur, things get incredible. They don't ever keep the water in the bushes anymore. I know? feel like that's it's, fake advertisement because I've been told since high school about the damn bushes. And it's like a couple of times it's actually happened. <laughs> yeah, you got to hit it right. But like back in the back in the early 2000s, they used to keep it. It used to get up to 307, 308, 310, and they let it just sit there and hold. And, and then they just slowly worked it back out through Gaston and through the old lake. They just, man, they don't do that. They're very much more aggressive in how they control the flood and, and, and control the lake. And it just, so yeah, the water doesn't get to stay up there long anymore. And when it does, but the fish still get up there, you know, so like, the water came up a few feet, like it was 298, 299, and it went up to 303. Like them fish went up there because you could tell every fish in the lake was up there. Um, and you said it, something like, interesting, and I, I got I love this because we just talked about Okeechobee. Grassy, yeah. everyone knows, historically good. You even said it's historically good. Well, the monkey box at Okeechobee is good. Historic, yeah, historically yeah, good. You, you go to Okeechobee, you better fish the monkey box to cash a check. Grassy, you, no one would fault you if you said like, yeah, historically, I should stay around here when there's people. You chose now to go find that that magic juice. Is it just because you have history and confidence that'll work? Or is it just yeah, because well, her sets up differently? 
Well, I just, I think it was just that proximity to deep water. I felt like a lot of fish had came shallow, but it's still March, you know, it's still early. And we just, I felt like we got some unseasonably warm weather. Yes. And it just, yeah. You know, and I just felt like, yes, those fish are going to be dirt shallow. Maybe they're not dirt shallow all the way in the back of some of these creek arms. So a lot of my competition, and we'll get to it, I guess, in a little bit as I kind of go through the day on how it actually went. But um, they they were dirt shallow, but they weren't dirt shallow everywhere, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. so I figured it out. Um, those pockets where I, and this is where it gets interesting, right? So those little pockets where I thought were going to be the deal, and I caught them literally right up to the buzzer on Friday when I was like, all right, I got to take out because anything else I catch is just, I'm just hurting myself. So um, come off the water you know, when no, I know my boat number, um, I'm third flight. So I know, like, I don't know that what I'm going to get a shot at. We launch in the morning. It rained the whole night, cold rain, um, launching it's torrential rain. I'm running with goggles on. I mean, it was, it was not fun. I get to the first spot. And so for reference, like we, you come out of Okanichi, go down, you go around, go past grassy, you make the big turn, you start going back up. Like there's a stretch of a bunch of pockets, like Clyde's Island area. Anybody that's listening to this, they'll know Clyde's Island area, that whole stretch from there up to, uh, Panhandle or, um, Rudd's Creek. I was kind of fishing a lot of those pockets. There was other people fishing them too, but I just knew like, that's where it was going to go down. Pulled into one of those pockets. First pocket that I thought was going to be the deal. No bites in it. And I go through there with the spinner bait and I'm like, oh, but when I dropped the trolling motor, like it was almost 60 degrees in there the day prior to the tournament, like right at the end of practice. When I dropped trolling motor, it was 54 in there. And I was like, okay, like, yeah, I expected it to, to attempt to drop, but I was like, it's cold. I was like, it's really cold. And like, I was like, okay, well, let me just give it a second to warm up, you know, let the, let the, let it acclimate. Well, it didn't acclimate it. Like after about 10 minutes in that cove, it was still in 54 at 54 hmm. and a half. I was like, it's cold. So I went down to the next pocket, which was like going to be good. No one fishing it. I'm like, okay, pull in there. Caught four in there. I think two small spotted bass, which I had not caught any spotted bass the whole practice the day before. And two small, large mouth, just barely keepers, like 14 inches. But I was like, I got four bites. I was like, okay. But again, four 54, it was on the knot. And it's like, so the whole consistently it dropped. And I'm like, man, I don't know. I just don't know. So Take it back day before last one of the very last spots I stopped after I caught a big one there, I went down to the south. So you got Grassy Creek. If you follow the turnaround, there's there's not necessarily creeks. You have Island Creek and you have Grassy and then Island's kind of on the outside end of that big turn. There's a couple pockets between Island Creek and Grassy. And I had went into one of those random pockets the day before stopped and I had got a few bites in there swimming a jig. And one of the nine rods that I got a bite on, I said, well, let me swim a drink through here and see if I can get a bite. Got four, I think like three or four bites down through there. And, but I shook a lot of those fish off. I didn't catch them. So I was why like, swim well, jig? Um, cause it was kind of still and sunny. So that's kind of, I've really, uh, swim jig has really, um, I've me very fond of the swim jig. I've learned how, how, yeah. how critical deadly. Oh my gosh. So deadly. People don't even realize how deadly it is. I shouldn't even be talking about it, but, uh, yeah. So, uh, swimming a jig through there, got some bites, but yeah, I like it when it's like, it was sunny. The temp was right. It was calm, you know? And like, I was just like, yeah, I think I just knew it. I was like, well, let me just swim this thing around. And I got bit in like immediately. I was like, yeah. And I caught, I caught one about close to five pounds on it on Friday. So I was like, yeah, it could go down, but I knew, it was going to rain. So I said, I knew going into it though, that the spinner bait was going to be the deal. I knew that I didn't want to throw it around a lot on Friday because I knew I was going to need it. Question then, uh, Fountainhead, everyone's like, you got to throw a spinner bait in, in my brain. Cause I only throw swim jigs and I've cashed a lot of checks with swim jig is like, okay, everyone's going to go left. I go right. Cause if you tell me like the spinner baits, the deal or a chatter bait, how many of those are they going to see through the day? And Kerr is a great example of that. Is it just like you have to throw the spinnerbait? Because my thought is like literally 500 people are throwing a freaking spinnerbait right now. I, yeah. 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 So, and it, you're right. So it goes back. Like sometimes you want to do something different and stand out from the crowd. Sometimes you got to know when to just throw in the towel and do what everyone's doing. Or then you, but it's just, it's so hard. Like I wish I could, yeah. if I had, if I knew that answer, I would be True. You know, blessing, but right. I, I think it's just a feel <laughs> thing. It's a confidence thing. Um, I just knew, like I knew with the rain, I was like, I knew in the stain in the water, it was not clear. I needed something that was going to have some flash some vibration. And I, 
had I tossed it around a little bit on Friday, and it, when I say a little bit, every pocket I went into, I pretty much led with the spinnerbait, and I got bit in every pocket. So I said, I don't want to fish the entirety of the pocket with the spinnerbait because I don't want to show every fish in here what I need tomorrow. So let me fish some other stuff. See what I can get bit on this piece of wood, this piece of wood, this piece of wood. Okay, well, I know when I come back tomorrow, high percentage. Bing, 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 bing. Hit all these things in here with the spinnerbait. Make great casts. A couple multiple casts because that's another thing is multiple casts to the same piece of structure this time of year. That's, I mean, it's one of those things. And high percentage areas, multiple casts, in, out. Fish fast, slow, like we talked about. Um, so... Yeah, I, it, the spinnerbait, man, it's just, I just knew I was going to need it. So I didn't fish it around a lot, knowing that I was going to keep it in my hand. I, yeah, I was going to use it. So I did. I knew, I, but I but I, I used it just enough to show me that they were in each place. And, and voila. So I knew I went to the south side of the lake in that little pocket where I had thought, okay, well, I got some bites in there. I pulled in there, dropped trolling motor. Water temp is 58 almost. Now, polar opposite of the day before water temp on the bottom side of the lake, even at the end of the day was 56, 55. So something happened overnight where like, I think they stopped pulling water and I don't know this for a fact. Like I know they stopped pulling water cause the lake leveled out and was actually stable and even tried to rise as just a hair of the day of the tournament. Cause I seen it, the water level raised in that pocket during the day. Um, but something happened where the, I guess incoming water coming through the Roanoke and the Dan from all the rain we had, they stopped pulling water. So maybe it did some sort of backflow. I don't know what happened, mm. but I know that all of my stuff on the bottom side of the lake, which was colder the day before was all of a sudden warmer the, the next day. And I don't know why or what happened because I just didn't get that vibe in the first two pockets I went in. They were colder. I went to the bottom side. It was warmer and confirmation of thought i didn't make it 15 yards and that 560 yeah how much time did you burn between spots like going from up like so just oh, not, long, kind of have, not long those not two long. pockets those two pockets i fished that i caught so i fished one nothing maybe 20 minutes tops in that one first pocket nothing second pot or pocket i caught four same thing probably not long 20 minutes maybe so i had okay. pulled into the this other area not within an hour of the start of the day probably uh, okay like, gotcha so I, and I so first two pockets nothing and i was like i knew i was like let me just go try it before i run further down the lake because i had planned on going like to ruds and some other places so i ran just basically came out of the pocket instead of going to you know up and down the lake i went straight across and went in this little pocket between island and grassy and when i pulled in there there's a little stretch of riprap bank there um and i was like well i'll just follow my trail where i got bit and I dropped troll motor. I was like, oh, it's warmer. Cool. Let me just keep fishing. And like I said, I didn't go 15 yards and uh, 561 ate it right at the boat um, spinnerbait. I mean, I, went, I literally went to go pull this thing out of the water and you, I could see like the orange head come up out of the water. And as I seen the, it, I, as I could see it, I watched the mouth open. The boat, the, the bass actually came oh, from God. under, it came from under the boat and like somehow ate it and went away from me with it. And I had like this much line out. <laughs> on on my rod i don't know how i like and i got my hands on it like four times and it kept getting away from me it was a miracle that i caught that fish i don't know how i caught it um dude but, yeah. uh, how'd you not break uh that's a good question like i like just years of knowing like 10 years ago i would have broke that puppy off no no question but like just really? knowing, i've had it yeah i've just just tons of time on the water just I just looked down. I was like, "Oh!" And it was just a little, just one little jerk. Just enough. <laughs> you would have just, just, just in, that. Yeah, just enough. I was like, "Oh!" I, like that. The, uh, and then hooked it and literally fought it around in a figure eight with you know a foot of line out, basically somehow. Jesus, man! Uh, I knew it was a big one too. I was like, "Oh, this is you know when you catch five pounder cur, that's a big fish. You know, it ain't like the days of old where you know their cr curs cranking out a bunch of giants." I knew when I hooked it and I seen it in the water. I was like, "Oh, that's five pounder." No, those are um, unicorns. That could, be, that could be big fish. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, catch that fish, thankfully. And I'm like, all right, cool. I've made the right decision. Water's warm over here, got bit. Let me keep following my line. So I follow my line. And man, I don't, I went, it was like one little pocket. And then you go around that pocket, around a dock and into another. And there's some, there was some bushes that had a little bit of water on them. Roll the spinnerbait by a bush, catch another one that's like close to four pounds. And I'm like, oh, mm. 
okay, like these fish that I was shaking off the day before were actually good ones, I guess. <laughs> um, so catch that one. And at that point, you know, I'm, I got four fish, two dinks and two good ones. And I'm how much weight? I don't know. So I had that five, I, I had no scale. Um, my scale stopped working. So I I'm eyeballing everything at this point. Um, so I had a five, the five sixty one, and I had another one that was close to four, maybe a four pounder and a two small ones, 14 inches. Um, so what, 11, 12 pounds ish, probably something like that. And like, I'm, sh you know, shaking after I'm like, Oh, I got two. And I stood up and I'm like, oh, I got two bites. I was like, I got two of the right ones. I need three more bites. So I like, it's torrentially downpouring in this pocket. And I'm like, be smart, Chaz retie so i sit there i bend my spinnerbait back in i retie and i stand up and i cast to the opposite and where i'm in a little narrowed kind of creek at this point it's like the bush is on one side I just caught this four pounder out of stand up cast backhand to the bush opposite of me catch another two something like the very next cast i'm like okay now i got five like life is good um what time know, is it Oh man, it's early. It's probably nine something, maybe. Uh, not even. Might not even nine. I don't even know. I looking back, it was. It, it seemed early. Like I said, I might have only spent forty five minutes in my first two pockets, and then maybe at this point, I uh, twenty minutes over there, and I'd had five. You know, to get, go through and catch those three fish down through there. Um, the, the decisions right here is so fascinating to me because you got your five. Okay, relax a little bit. Do you keep doing what you're doing and comb through them and you hope you hit bigger ones or do you well, do yeah. the, the jig glide thing? Well, no, because I knew I wasn't going to glide because the water clarity was not there. It was not. And I I brought it because I've got the itch. to. I, it's that time of the year, right? But it's just, it wasn't the water clarity just was not there. I knew I was not going to be able to catch them on a glide, or at least not in any high efficiency manner, right? And I, I knew I only had two good bites. I knew I, I had room to grow. So... I fished, I turned around thinking, okay, like I fished that little area. I think I turned back around and fished my line back out thinking, okay, maybe another couple of big ones have pulled up onto this same area. I fished through there. I think I did catch one other fish uh, on a chatterbait. That's like one of the only times I picked up another rod throughout the day. I threw a jack handle around a little bit, caught one fish through another two something that culled one of my smaller 14 inchers. But I, I, in my head, I was like, it took me another probably 30, 25 or 30 minutes to fish that back through pretty thoroughly and around the point that I pulled in on. And I was like, ah, I don't want to die here. You know, I don't know how, I don't even know what time it was. I was like, but I just need to keep making good decisions. So like in my head, I'm thinking water temperature, like it was critical over here. Water temperature was right. I was like, but your pockets over there weren't good. There was a couple of pockets adjacent to me that were in the same general area of the lake, but I didn't get a ton of time to practice. And I, I went in one. And I set the boat down and it just looked too flat. Um, like there wasn't enough depth kind of further back. What just was the water temperature? The water temp was still right in there, but I just didn't see okay. a lot of wood in there. I didn't see a lot of stuff for me to throw. It was just a lot of sand bank and like flat leading up. It, it just didn't set up the way I wanted to. I, I didn't see a lot of stuff that I wanted to. I actually literally pulled into the next pocket over from that and then jumped it back on pad and left there. Cause I was like, I just, the water temp was right, but I didn't like it. So then in my head I'm leaving and I'm like, all right, what's next in my rotation? Well, I have a lot of historic, um, like a lot of history with panhandle Creek. I've caught a lot of fish in there over the years. Um, it's just always been good to me. So I was like, let me check panhandle since I know I'm going to drive back by it. It's on that side of the lake. I don't know what the water temp is going to be, but let me run about halfway back and see if the water temp is stable. So, I ran in there, there's a couple boats fishing some of the places I wanted to fish. The first spot I stopped in on Panhandle, it's the same place I caught a couple good ones last year in the team event that we, uh, my partner and I cashed check-ins, pulled up there. I got right to my line with the spinner bait, throw it out there, three quarter rounds, let it count it down, start reeling it. I don't even barely get the thing engaged. Blow, one knock slack in it, mm. Put, set the hook, nothing blows it open. I don't, I don't hook it. I'm like, dang it. Okay. And I fish down through there. It's a little small, little rock vein section. That's been really good to me and no other bites there. I'm like, okay, leave real quick. That didn't take five minutes bounce up. I, there's another stretch just across from it on the other side of the Creek. That's got some good wood on it and it's just been good. So, and I knew with the water level, they had, it was going to have enough water on it. Pulled over there, dropped the trolling motor. I know I didn't go 50 yards or more and the first piece of wood i came to a three and a half ish or bigger ate it very close to the boat 
caught it. Thank God. Like just good timing the whole day, like just not pulling it away from them, making good decisions. So I caught that one. That's a, you know, another great bag. Great, fish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm thinking in my head, I'm like t- telling myself like, now this could happen. You got three of the right ones and you got a kicker. Like this could happen. Um, what time is, is it? Probably 10 30, maybe 10 ish. It's probably 10 something, probably around 10, I guess. I don't know. Plenty of day I mean, left. Yeah. There, yeah. The clock was like, it was raining so hard. I didn't even pull the phone out or anything. It was just torrential rain this entire time that we're talking about all this going on. Just like, just, you know, just, just as wet as you could imagine, as miserable as you can imagine. But the fish are biting. So I wasn't complaining. So I catch that one excited literally bend the spinner bait back in and i follow this is on the lead into a little pocket it's got some wood so i follow it into the shallow part of the pocket i think i caught another one in the back of the pocket that didn't help following that same pocket back out as it approaches the main lake next piece of good wood over there boom another three something i'm like oh my gosh there's four i said so you keep saying rebend the spinner bait and i think this is important because everyone loves those thin wire baits but i've heard horror stories of people halfway through the day they hit a six oh, and then they snap the bait do you, do you when do you it's change them out? i went through three <laughs> holy crap okay i went so i went through three in two days of fishing so i went through two on tournament day though this was this is one of two i have the other one late i think sitting on the trophy in there probably um but yeah so this was one of two i went through two this is actually the one that i caught the big one on in the morning um, and a couple of those. And I think at some point, I can't remember if I switched that before I got into panhandle or not. I think I switched it right after I caught that fourth good fish. I think I switched from this one to another one. And, uh, so yeah, it, yeah. A lot of time left in the day. I'm thinking, Oh my gosh, here we go. Four good bites. All it needs one more, you know? And I ran every good section of panhandle that I had caught fish in every every bend every tree to something to something to something to something i think i incrementally called that small two like i had a two something in the well and i called that two something several times throughout Without a scale yeah with, with yeah which is cold beam just call it because oh, i knew yeah, cold, it was, okay thank god yeah, okay. Beam, with cold beam with a cold beam um but incrementally like very small calls like a two and a mm. two and a quarter to a two and a half to a two like some of them some of them could be ounces but i was checking every one of them because i i was catching a lot of them you can't see it now but dude i had the <laughs> most incredible bass thumbs you'd ever believe i bet i caught 50 or 60 in two days between practice and the tournament it was incredible um mm. so fished all of panhandle just blasting them in every pocket you go in just I mean, every one of them. And I'm just thinking, okay, one of these is going to be one of the ones. One of these is going to be the one of the ones. Well, if, at this point, I fished a, a couple hours, another hour or two at least in Panhandle till I think probably lunchtime. Never another call. And I'm thinking, man, what's going on? So I leave Panhandle and I was going to go even further down the lake, go into Ruds or go in some other places. But something in my gut was like, no, just don't. Don't go far. Try to just, you've already demonstrated that, like, not to sidestep, but I qualified for the ABA national championship on Kerr uh, a couple years ago. And I, the first day of the tournament, I tested my luck till the very end of the day with a good bag and blew my lower unit right outside of Okanichi. And yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, and, and, and Tyler Trent ended up winning that event and I would not have beat him cause he was on, him, but I would have at least been there right at the end. Um, I, I think had I not got DQ'd, I would have finished top five in that tournament. Um, for the first day. Um, but yeah, so yeah, in my head, I'm like, don't go super far, stay close, fish some of these areas. You've already caught some big ones, you know, they're around. So I go back through some of those pockets. I started the morning in fish several of those pockets on the Clyde's Clyde's Island area, caught fish in every one of those pockets, none of them cold, or if they did, it was very incremental. It wasn't much. Um, just, so it's just lots of fish catching all down through the, there. I went back to the pocket that I caught the two big ones in the morning, caught a couple more fish in there. Again, didn't help or didn't help at all really. So I, that whole midsection of the day where I'm like, Oh, I got plenty of time. Like I fished and caught fish all over that section of the lake between there and never really called. So at this point, uh, I think around three o'clock I was like, well, what can I do? Um, you know, I need to catch some big ones. I, I left, 
think at that point I was in the Island Creek. I went and bounced from the fish. I went over in the Island Creek and fished some hits, some stuff I know in an Island and didn't catch any coal fish. And I thought, well, I'll just run back up by Okanichi and fish a couple of those pockets on the North side of the lake. And maybe it'll happen. Pulled in one pocket, fished through there about 15 minutes, nothing motored. I'm like, well, let me save a little time. There was a guy in the pocket between the one I wanted and like, let me go around him. I went up to the very next pocket and motored in, dropped troll motor, fishing the left bank in, um, looked good, had trees in it. And that, especially that upper end near Okanichi, all those pockets from the water flood control have tons of wood in them, like a lot from years of going up and down. So I went in and started fishing down first piece of wood. It came to a four pounder, just smoked it. <laughs> Right mm. as I was going to pull it out of the water for the third time of the day. So three of my fish, I basically could have pulled it away from it. And they hit it right, pulling it out of the water. They, I guess I pulled them off the bank and they followed it right to the boat. I was going to say, are they sharking it or were they just off the bank to begin with and you brought it to them? I don't, you know, I, and, and I don't know, honestly. The first one I felt like was underneath the boat. The big one that I felt like was underneath the boat. The other two felt like they might have followed it off the wood, but I'm not really sure. Um, but that, that was pretty much it. So it was kind of like all happened in the beginning, then a long lull of catching fish, but no calls. And then one big one right at the end of the day. Um, and at that point it was like three, when I caught that fish, it, I know it was after three thirty when I caught that one. Um, and I didn't and, have, and again, the psychological thing that you decided to keep with the bait and it's like, I'm catching them, but they're not big enough. And you don't have the voice in your head, like throw the jig. I, the swim jig. Like, Trust me, I did. I thought about it and I did. I, I might've, I might've thrown the chatterbait a little bit and I did flip a jig and a few high percentage trees a little bit. I don't think I caught any flipping a jig, but yeah, like that's normally my gut would be to do something like that. A flip a jig, soak a high percentage area, try to catch a big one. But I just, I don't know as many as I was catching. I just felt like it was coming. I was like, if I just hit enough pockets and I get run into one of these that somebody hasn't hit yet, and I hit it at the right angle. Cause I was like, you, you couldn't fish the, every pocket, the whole pocket. Cause obviously there's just time management. So I was trying to hit high percentage stuff, <clears throat> windblown wood, um, you know, right on a break or, you know, some of them were dirt shallow in the backs of the pockets, but it had the right wind on it. You know, it, it was, it was just a literally just seeing it. Not every pocket had what it needed. And I would motor in there, look, Oh, didn't motor around. And, you, once I found one that had like the right steepness of the bank with the right, like it was almost automatic. And, it, and the crazy thing is a lot of us were doing the same thing. I don't know if it was just a section of the lake because I really didn't have a lot of company. I think people hmm. like I, there was a few people in that Clyde's Island section, but like the, the pocket that I did all my damage in, there was I never saw a boat in there at all. The other rest of the day, even the little back half stretches of pack of panhandle that I fished, I didn't have a ton of pressure in there. There seemed to be a ton of guys either fishing out on the main or they were fishing way in the back. But the why? in between, why, why, why do you think that? I don't know. I, I think I, I just think all of us kind of trying to fish to our strengths. Probably a lot of guys mm -hmm. knew they were dirt shallow, and like I felt like they were dirt shallow, but not necessarily dirt shallow in the backs of every single far end creek, like way in the back of handle handle or way in the back of roads or way in the back of butchers. There's a lot of people sampling that. And maybe there was, I mean, maybe I didn't, I just felt like I was fishing dirt shallow, but I was fishing dirt shallow with, with good access to deep water, very close nearby. Would you say that this is like, I mean, it's interesting cause like it is, I mean, when this tournament happened, it was like the first few days of March. Like, mm -hmm. do you think the spawn's going to happen there early this year? I've thought that a lot. Like, it is yeah, weird. It's already, how already, there's people catching, uh, people are catching spawn and fish this weekend where I live. Uh, this past weekend, I know somebody caught us a, a bed fish off Smith Mountain Lake this past weekend, seven pounder. What is that going to do for the blueback spawn, the shad spawn, like every, the whole biology of these clocks? Because I think like the BFLs are coming to occur like late April. Is that going to be just full, yeah. just blueback post spawn? I don't know. I guess it depends on what we see. Like there'll still be, they'll still be spawned that late. Like, really? I just, yeah, they'll be spawning for sure. They, they, they it just prolongs because what's going to happen is it, 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 we're going to get warm weather. And then now this week is cold you know, leading up to like our Smith mountain Lake tournament this weekend, the weather's crap leading up to it. Um, it's just how it always is. But so I think it's just, we're going to get, you get hit, get warm. Then they get up there and they're like, Oh, 
and the fronts happen. It's all based on time of day and moon phase and all that stuff anyways. Weather plays a huge part of it. So I think it'll just accelerate the spawn a little bit, but then at the same time, it ends up dragging it out. You don't get those big waves, I feel like. Like you do get one big wave and then you get hit with a bunch of fronts. Then the fish get all screwed up because they're sitting up there and then it's 30 degrees at night. Like I said, I think one of the lows I saw this week was in the 20s up there you know, at Smith Mountain Lake. So those fish were, you know, thinking, oh, we're spawning and now it's 20 degrees at night. But I mean, they're not going back out to the main lake. Mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, they're there. They're going to sit tight and, and hang out, I guess, you know. So, but it's like that everywhere. It's just, it seems like you get warm weather. It screws them kind of all up. They come up, they try to spawn and then then it'll probably be front after front and then they're just slowly trickling up. It'll probably make it tough. I'm sure. I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing. Um, it's good right when you, when they first come up, like it was at Kerr, but I don't know how it'll affect the long term. you know, how April's going to turn out, you know, unless yeah, we I'm always curious about that, like how it affects all that stuff. Cause you know, generally speaking on those like blueback herring lakes, like Murray and Hartwell, it's like, as soon as the post spawn for largemouth kind of kick in, that's when that blueback bite starts to really heat up as the blueback starts spawning. But it's like, if you get a super cold spring or a super warm spring, does that speed it up or slow that whole process up? Like, I don't know. It's fascinating. To me. I don't know. Yeah. It's almost water body of water dependent. It's very, it is fascinating. And I, I've, I used to love spawn fishing. I'm not as good as I, I don't have the patience like I used to. I don't think um, my partner is a huge spawn fisherman, sight fisherman. So, but it, like it, for me, I do love to sight fish, but man, like I cannot stand like the tournament fisherman in me just wants to go fishing instead of looking at them. But it's, yeah, I, I, I know I don't look forward to spawning tournaments anymore like I used to just because I don't know. I just like to fish. And my How many of, tournaments do you have that line up that way, though? Honestly, for a, like a, a legit spawn derby. It just depends. Yeah, it really just depends on weather. Yeah. I mean, you know, April's a pretty much a, a sure bet of you're probably going to be spawn fishing somewhere in April. You can bet. Um, and but for me, I always try to do one or like if if it's a spawn event, I'm trying to catch pre spawners or I'm trying to catch post spawners. You know, I'm trying to do the opposite of like unless really? it truly, yeah, unless it truly sets up where there's giants up on the beds everywhere and I have to spawn, you know, go sight fish, then I will. But I'm always trying to find pre spawners or post. Do you ever try to mix it up like to do a little do. bit of a, a little bit of B? Because yeah, I'm absolutely. Making, like, yeah. You got like to, if it's, yeah. you, you have to, if you're like, you have, like you, 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 like you want to start your morning. Like if you have some big ones on the bed, you can run to and catch right away. That's one thing. But, um, you know, I, a lot of times I'll fish and then I'm like, Oh, I've got a five or a six. I'll go catch that. If I can, you know, you're going to have to, it's hard to win and not at least catch a couple off the bed. Um, well, especially in a single day event, you know, that's where I think okay. it's different. Like a, a open example versus one day where like, I, I I don't know. Like that question came up in my chat a couple, a couple weeks ago where it's like, can you still win in a spawn derby? And it's like, not, not in an opens anymore with, with forward facing sonar. I just feel like you can't do it for three days, but a one day or I still feel like you could probably luck into five lockdown. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You, you definitely can. Like there's plenty of tournaments one every year, just straight side fishing. I mean, even on a three day, you get somebody like Drew cook who can, that's true. Fish four days and and out of sight fish everybody. That's just a true master at his at, at his craft. He's just really really good at it. Um, you know, some guys are really good at it, and it, you know, knowing how to read fish, you bed fish enough, you know, when you pull in, the the language on that fish, whether or not it's going to bite or it's not. And I I think that's why I don't like to do it anymore because I pull in and I got an eight pounder I found the day before, and I pull in and she's floating all around and she ain't sitting at and oh we're just gonna sit and wait on it no we're not i'm not waiting two hours for this fish to settle down and of course by the time i come back it's been plucked by somebody you know because it settled down while i was gone so but it's just it's just fishing i guess what's the difference between reading a fish on a bed and reading a fish on scope it's basically the same type of same yeah. type of deal isn't it body it language be, yeah it, it's body language yeah for sure i mean i guess in when you're looking at them on the scope though like typically you're looking at fish that are you know, are one of two things. They're either out in the middle, they're being pelagic and they're chasing bait fish. And then those are super susceptible to hit with the minnow and stuff because they just, I mean, they're not getting tons of, you know, pressure out there in the middle or historically they haven't. So now that's why you see every fish you throw at in the middle is like, Oh, and just opens his mouth and eats. Cause it's like, Oh, where'd this come from? You just dropped on my head from, you know, like, whereas the shallow fish get a lot of 
pressure and like you can see them like they 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 just kind of react differently it's like that's why i feel like eventually once the pressure gets caught up with it all those pelagic fish and all these fisheries are eventually going to be acting like the shallow fish had for years with just ducking from jig head mm-hmm. minnows that are just raining in the middle of the creek on them that's it's only a matter of time before those that's a huge population of fish i mean you think about it like for years we all fish and we fish down the bank you know unless you're david fritz and you're you're fishing offshore back in the 90s but like if you think about it 90 percent of the fish were all behind us out in the middle mm-hmm. of the lake and the only time we caught them was when they decided to come shallow you know no. and now everyone's like oh well, why would we go to the bank you know and i i still love to fish the bank you know and and i you know you can still win on the bank as last weekend shows but we our our opportunities are limited. We we don't get those. I mean, you can still win shallow year round on a lot of bodies of water. Kerr included, honestly, you can catch them very mm-hmm. shallow in the middle of summer on Kerr on a top water, like <laughs> in the dirt. Well, and that's really because of the blueback, honestly, and how they've influenced. I think personally, is it, I fished so many college tournaments, got my ass handed to me on Murray and Hartwell, and now I feel like I I see, have PTSD from those stupid blueback lakes. Um, yeah. It, they don't react it, then that yeah they don't behave like you would think a bass is supposed to behave they no, they, they, a striper. they behave yeah like a striper or a tuna that's how they act and you have to treat them as such and fish for them that way and think outside the box or you can't think of like this is the same bass that sits on a tree like he may sit on a tree but he might spend his whole life out there swimming in open water like a tuna eating fish like that's what they do and then i just think like i, I don't know there's probably a study or about like I just feel like there's two groups of fish. You have some that like to go shallow and they stay shallow and they live shallow and they're ambush predators. And then you have some that are pelagic and they're out with the team out hustling up Chad in the middle of the the creeks everywhere. You know, I don't know if there's a crossover between the two, but I feel like they're two different, completely different fish is the way I I feel. I I think they are. And, and, what is the blueback population like at Kerr? I mean, I'm not saying it's like Lake Murray level heart. I don't think it's like that. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I really don't know. I mean, it's tons of shad. I mean, anecdotally. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know how much is in there, but it's definitely changed. Um, like the shad in general, like the bay fish oh, it, in the lake is super healthy. Like any pocket you pull in, it's just incredible with the amount of bait out in the middle, which makes it hard. I like, I threw at some fish in practice for this out in the middle and could not get any to go. I know one of my buddies I stayed with caught one close to five pounds, just out in the random blob out in the middle of nowhere. So they're, they're out there doing that too. At Kerr, I think I got lucky because they all decided to go shallow. At least some of the big ones did, but um, yeah, it's just, that's just a weird, you know, I mean, how do you practice for that pre live scope? Right. Like I said, other than, well, you did. Yeah, but but those lakes are a little shallower too. So I think I that was like like one thing. Like our lakes don't really get over twenty feet in these little small lakes. Like you're throwing in the middle of a pocket at Kerr, it could be fifty foot deep out in the middle of that thing somewhere. That's or true. you go to Smith, it could be a hundred foot deep. You know, and those fish do they at Smith Mountain do the same thing. You know, and and all the lakes I've realized that they're swimming around just suspended you know and i think that's where you're seeing all these life scope catches are coming from it's just that's a whole group of fish that were unmolested for decades that now all of a sudden it's like oh that is a bass and and you're right it is lake dependent because like smith is way cleaner and generally speaking and it does have a very healthy blueback population now in it at the bottom half to where that the whole i mean a classic pencil popper bite but those fish can feed up a lot more efficiently compared to Kerr, you know, and I've, I've had the Army Corps of Engineers on. It's like if they would just let that thing stabilize and clean up, I think the weights would go up through the roof. They really would if the if it would clean. Yeah, I think the you know, it can be like it was it, it just depends, I guess, like the low. It was incredibly clear last year. Um, God, I, I wish they would just the grass would come back in there. Like, they, yes, they, 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 oh. It you that's when it was in its heyday when it had some grass in the lake like nutbush area had some grass palmer's point had some grass grassy had some grass like it used to be good um and then <laughs> uh, for whatever reason i think the flood control the the extreme the fluctuations maybe in the water levels is what killed the grass i don't know or they sprayed it maybe i'm not sure they did um i i had them on the show last summer and i asked them about that because it's like but they have they have a they have a zero tolerance for hydrilla and they kill it on the spot and they also i think they said and guys you can go watch that episode i'll, I'll link it in the episode description i think it was like they dumped like a hundred thousand pounds of like grass carp in there just to like get rid of it um well, and, that's which is that's 
that's managing your resource terrible, right? That's yeah. not thinking it like, yes, hydrilla can be invasive and it can hurt lakes. Right. But let's look at what hydrilla can do. Let's look two lakes yeah. down from the same chain and look at Roanoke Rapids. Roanoke. Yep. It has hydrilla in it and is incredible. It's an incredible fishery. It, it doesn't hurt a fishery. And I've told, asked the biologist, could you please name a lake that it was like, there's too much. And they're like, Florida. Yes, you named a freaking swamp. Congratulations. Like besides Florida, name a lake. Show me a lake, yeah, show me a lake that's not beneficial from grass yeah. for the entire ecosystem. Now, yes. Gaston was great when I had it. Oh, man. Yes, it was. Absolutely. And the old lake is, you know, they're going to kill that soon, too. It's mark my words. They won't they, they can't let anything stay good for long. They got to kill it no matter no matter what wildlife resources commissions involved, whether it's Florida or it's, you know, if they're not Texas who actually cares about fishing and cares about the anglers, they're killing it. And because all they care about is homeowners and docks and blah, 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 blah. They don't care about the health of the, of the fishery. They don't care about any of that. Even Florida, like they're killing it left and right in Florida. They can't like, you know, you go to Harris chain when we were down there for the championship, all the grass and the whole lake. Like I went down there in 2019 grass everywhere, fishing phenomenal. Go there. There's grass. They killed the entire lake of the Harris, the whole Big Harris had no grass in it, except for one little section that they saved, which was the same place that every single person in the Elite Series whacked them in that, you know, Party Cove area. And it's the only place that still has grass in it. And we fished in there and there was a bunch of fish in there, but so was every other boat in the world. It's because, because of, yeah, it's all the New Yorkers that bought houses down there, but it's also, and I'm trying to get a guy on from the Maryland, from the Florida department to talk about this, but allegedly the difference in grass management strategies between Texas and Florida is Florida pays contractors by the gallon of pesticide they spray by the gallon. Everyone that's listening, that's yeah, asinine. That's yeah, and you see it anywhere with airboats, guys just roll. Yes, spray it. And like I, I don't know. Like I, it's. It, I'm trying not to see it through uh, too much of a, a selfish lens because I know I don't own the docks and I don't didn't I don't own waterfront property on these places. So I, I don't I can understand grass being a nuisance, but like spray it around your dock. Don't spray it for a hundred miles of shoreline. Like well, I, I, just, I'll be you can see it anyway. Like even in like we went to every chain, every lake in the chain, they were spraying on every one of them. You go in, bah, airboats back there, guys, just spraying as much far back as they could on anything that they could get their hands to. And it would just create nasty algae in the water. And yeah, I mean, it's just, it just sucks, man. They just can't, because hydrilla, like, I mean, I shouldn't say it, but the lakes here in Suffolk, they've got hydrilla in them. They finally, and they'll probably come kill that soon. I shouldn't even say it. Um, well, and, and this and is why I think there should responded, be. They've responded phenomenally to it. Like as soon as we got grass in the last five years, the fishing has just skyrocketed because the fish are like, oh, this is new. This is awesome. And I don't know who put hydrilla in there, but if you're listening to this, I appreciate you. No. And this is like, I've had Odenkirk <laughs> on the show before too. And um, it's again, another great episode because we talked about invasive species. Uh, he's part of the Department of Wildlife Resources, but he's kind of like the rock star that headed up the snake, the snakehead task force. And he wrote a paper saying like, we should keep snakehead, but I asked him, like, what's the difference between uh, an Asian carp, a zebra mussel, hydrilla, all these invasive species, and the Alabama bass? And he's like, you can't blanket everything just as a plus minus, like, one's good, one's evil. Like, like not, they're not all evil because they're invasive. And, yeah. you know, he talked about how hydrilla, in his example, you cannot have a kill at first sight for a multitude of reasons. Number one is hydrilla will grow in places no other vegetation will. And number two... If you have hydrilla growing next to native stuff, the only way you can get rid of the hydrilla is to nuke bomb the native shit. And yeah, so you, you can't, that doesn't work. And I really <laughs> hope we can start convincing not only the DWRs, but these retarded homeowners that live in New York, buy a lake house, and they say, this is not a swimming pool. And it's like, yeah, you dumb bitch. It's not a swimming pool. It's the wildlife. Like yeah. you wouldn't buy yeah, a house gotta, in the like, woods. Buy, yeah. If you buy a house on a lake, you buy a what house did you expect? Or, or a river or anything. Yeah. It is a public body of water that is a resource owned by the, by everyone and shared by all, <laughs> you know, and it's not just for development and, you know, having your dock nice and clean so that you can swim around it. Like what about the fish that live in there? You know? So like, I, but I agree, like sometimes it can choke a lake out. It can get bad, but man, it takes years and years and years of mismanagement and for that to happen. Yeah, and if you and, just and I really, it, yeah. like we were like 
we're supposed to do is manage our resource and let it thrive. It could be great for the fishermen. It could be great for the fish. It could be great for everyone involved because how many billions of dollars a year yeah. are bass fishermen generating and, you know, revenue for all the lakes around this country? It's, it's, and the algae blooms and everything and like all that other crap is fixed with aquatic vegetation. But it, it's, it is a hundred percent the homeowners that are deranged and they're people that aren't outdoor people. Hunters know how to handle wildlife. They're not Absolutely. the ones saying like, let's bring wolves back to Colorado because that's a great idea. Yeah, Those right? are idiots. And yeah, I, yeah. I've always told this story and I'll tell it again. Like I got paid a lot of money when I had a landscaping company because these people from DC moved out to Western Loudoun and they had a bunch of woods and they wanted us to vacuum up in between the trees all with fucking HVACs, all of the leaves, twigs and shit until there was nothing but just bare dirt. And they wanted us to put blue pebble stones there because they thought it would look nice. This is four acres of woods. We had to vacuum. Th they had the money. They were absolutely batshit insane. We did that thing. These are the people that buy $2 million lake houses. They're yeah. not, they, yeah. they don't have that common sense like us. <laughs> no, I don't, you know, and that's what you're competing with. Unfortunately, those are also the type of people that are running our country and are yep. <laughs> you know, yeah, are pretty making, much yeah important decisions based on yeah it's just it's it's sad but yeah i wish we would manage a resource and, and like like it's it's very slept on i don't think people realize but like virginia like the dmv i guess you would say like there's great mm -hmm. fishing yeah. opportunities, man i mean between virginia north carolina maryland like we have yeah. some insane bodies of water with some insanely talented anglers around and it'd be a lot better if we manage our resources because i mean we have legit double digit bass swimming around all over the state <laughs> like states like mm -hmm. and if we just managed it and cared a little bit like who knows what we could have like i mean the james river was on a clip where you know elite series and you know ml like it was on the up and up you know like you you could see like if we just manage this resource and put a little effort in and, and maybe try to draw uh, you know, our chambers of commerce and stuff and tourism tried to actually draw some tournaments in and get some people here and showcase the state Smith Mountain Lake. I mean, or, or any of these, like, you know, it's on the crazy up and up that it, it's about due for another big tournament. Um, you know, if, if they yeah, to I agree. Yeah, I agree with that. It, it definitely is. It's, it, it's on the up and up, um, Potomac, you know, the Potomac, Potomac's just been getting beat to death every year forever. Um, well, they never, it, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, and it, it's a shame because they should reward lakes that are doing good. And even if they don't want the chair, like at least offer it. Cause like, that's why you end up going to Kerr 37 times because you won't go to Gaston when it's on fire. Cause you won't go to Lake Anna when it's on fire. Yeah, well, like, and the BFLs like, you know, they get so locked into going to the same places every year. I wish they would switch it up. You yes. the participation, like at the same time, same lakes every single time. Like, it, you know, I Smith Mount Lake is good. I love that place. You know, Kerr is kind of good. I have got a lot of history, but it would be nice to go some different places, you know? I mean, I know like the sound, like I said, the Albemarle sound down there, I think the logistics on the launch and stuff might be t challenging for them, but they're going to figure it out with the, I, I, once the BPT happens and the MLF hits it this year, you'll see they're going to be adding it to some schedules because people are going to blow the doors open on them. Well, well, last thing, la last thing I really want to touch on then is why hasn't there been a big tournament Relative, let's say BFL level at Gaston or Lake Anna, because those are two lakes um, where, like, I, just, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think they just don't want to get out of their comfort zone. I think, you know, I think BFLs, you know, they don't stray from what they do. They pretty much, if you look historically, they don't ever go to new places. It's only the places they've always gone. You know, uh, FLW had that model, and I think, you know, MLF came in and bought them, and they pretty much just stuck and followed the model. They, they're not thinking outside the box on trying to bring new bodies of water in. They've got pretty much, I think some of the same tournament directors and everybody's just pretty doing much. the same thing. And I don't, I'm not faulting them. Like, you know, it is what it is. It's a, they're in it for the money. You know, their payback is what it is. We know what the payback is. Um, it would be nice Last to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it'd be nice to fish some different stuff though. You know, that, uh, just different bodies of water at different times, at least if we're going to go to the same places, like, you know, that's kind of why I'm not fishing them just because I, I got a taste last year and I know what I'm getting and the payout was what it was. I cashed three checks and still in the red, and, you know, you fish it for the regionals and the, and the chance to make money at the higher, um, the higher level, I think is why you fish well, the regionals. With that said, you know, like the, the, I promise the last, last thing is 
Could you have a Toyota series style mid Atlantic thing or bass open? Cause it's so interesting. It's like, it's always, we have to either go to Canada or we go almost to Mexico with Florida. It's like, there's this big swath of middle where you could do Smith mountain Lake Kerr, maybe throw in like an up, like a Chesapeake or a Potomac. Yeah. Um, there's lots of, uh, yeah, there's man, there's ton North Carolina ton, yeah. Super, like falls Lake. Jordan Lake, all those lakes, phenomenal lakes. And well, if you're going to go to Kerr and you're going to go to Norman, why would you not go to Jordan or Falls? Both of them way better than both of those places in terms of how big of how, are they? Um, you know, I don't know. I think big enough to support the tournaments. I don't, I don't think they're, Fair enough. I mean, yeah. they, they're, they're running cat tournaments and other stuff down out of there. So I don't, I mean, and you see the weights, I mean, guys are just absolutely blasting them. So I just think, the bigger tournament trails just don't want to step outside of the norm. They just do what they do and they don't, they know that they're going to get 120 to 140 boats. Cause just people, I mean, I don't know what they're getting these days, but um, they know what they're going to get and they know what they're going to make. Right. And money wise. So it's just money for them. So I, I just think they're not inclined to go out and fish different places. Maybe one day they will, but I don't know. The BFLs are, not looking good. They're dying. They're yeah, dying. They're, I mean, and like as somebody who didn't have a ton of experience with them, but like I, like I said, I fished it last year. I enjoyed it because I knew there was going to be some great anglers, and I was hoping the jackpot and win one. But um, you know, it's just yeah, you win and you win some money. You know, what do you what did what did the winner at the Smith Mountain Lake tournament win this past weekend? I don't know. Like three dollars. I mean, yeah. It's yeah not a I lot. mean, so yeah, so and so like. Twelve thousand, you know, for this tournament. So, like, that's why I kind of, you know, alpha is the way to go for in terms of payout. If you're around here, if you guys are listening to this, like, I mean, the entry fee is a little higher, but I mean, it's ninety percent payback. It's not in the seventy percentage range, I think, which is what the BFLs are, and you know, you can actually win some real money. Had I been running a uh, newer bass cat, I would have won nineteen thousand five hundred dollars Saturday, last Saturday, for one day. With Damn. contingencies, yeah, with contingencies. Unfortunately, I was my boat does not qualify, but that's it. I mean, had, it, yeah. It, yeah, of course it doesn't because it's uh, because I'm not yeah. running the 22 or newer. Yeah. Mine's, all mine's, you had to do was spend a hundred thousand dollars and you would have made like an extra five, just buy another one, you know, yeah, and, uh, but you know, 12,000, right? Or I what 11,000 for first, you know, for one day of that's awesome. I mean, entry fee was 500 bucks. Um, so okay, but I mean, it's double the entry fee, but quite literally double the money and we paid out 15 places. I mean, I think, you know, we were still paying out nearly a thousand dollars way down the, you know, in 10th or 11th place. I, I mean, don't quote me, but, um, in, in a single event, you know, you're not dealing with co-anglers. Um, so nothing against co-anglers cause I was a co-angler professional co-angler here, but, um, you know, it's just, uh, the money was there. It seemed like a better business model for me in terms of potentially winning some money and maybe making some money. Um, same thing with our team events. Um, I think we're 7,500 for the winner for those. Um, you know, so you still equal a BFL win, but, um, yeah, I don't know, man. I just, it is sad about the BFLs. You know, I kind of wish somebody would breathe a little bit new life into them, maybe enhance the payout structure. Cause like we historically know, like the BFLs are paying for the BPT and paying for like, why is there a tackle where nothing against anyone fishing? The, is it the pro circuit now? What is it? Is it the invitationals? I think it's the tackle warehouse circuit, but honestly it's there because it gives a people of the BPT two circuits to fish that have good payout because it, this is the one thing they, they, again, I think, B MLF has a lot of great ideas that were executed poorly for sure. The bass open suck when it comes to payouts, but yeah. all the pros fish them. What they kind of tried to do with MLF is like, let's have two circuits that don't conflict that have good payouts that you could fish both potentially great idea. Not executed very well though. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I like everyone got that invitation to go fish the invitationals, yep. right? I mean, co anglers were getting the invitation. I think I got the invitation to be honest with you. <laughs> like, like, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's just money's drying up. Money's yeah, drying it is, up. It is. It's sad because you know what? Like, there's more money in it now, industry wise, than there ever was. If you think about well, it, yeah, like, baits and it, just 
they yeah. like I know how much money I'm spending on tackle. I know how much money everybody else is spending on tackle. It's not like the money's gone away. I think we're just, you know, I mean, think about it. They were fishing for five hundred thousand and million dollars in the Forest Wood Cub back in the day, and here we are in twenty twenty four, and we're still fishing for our own entry fees. You know, like there's not nobody wants to support it because I think sponsors aren't getting a return on their investment. You know, which it's just a, yeah, it's not a. It's sad that like that's a whole other discussion, but the pro, the professional yeah. aspect of the business is is kind of it's kind of sad right now, unfortunately. No, it it, it sucks. Um, you know, I think the industry really wants to have a monopoly, uh, like to monopolize itself, because if it does that, it can cut costs on professionals, which is why when people talk about only having one circuit, understand that when you do that, you are cutting half the professional anglers. So just always understand the context and you know, these big corporations run it. And if you have it all get eaten up into, you know, Berkeley, Rapala, Arby Garcia are all one company. Sounds that's going to cut like costs. Socialism. Sounds a lot like, yeah, yeah communism I, I, in the fishing industry. Exactly. And, but that's what, that's the silent death that you're seeing here when these things all get gobbled up into one big bog. And I would be whitewater. Look what they did. Like, I'm just saying like, it's there, but that's the stuff everyone wants to talk about forward facing sonar, but they're not talking about all this other stuff that's happening behind the yeah, scenes. The private capital buyouts of all the, the bait companies. And yeah, there's a whole other sinister effect going on in the, you know, yeah. And sponsorship dollars are not there anymore. And anglers are, you know, it's going over to the YouTube and perfect. That's why professional anglers all burn out of shape because they're not getting their money like they used to. It's just, but you know, I mean, Times change. We have to adapt. Um, you know, we're supporting these companies, right? So think about that when you're spending money. Uh, yep. That's that's the ultimate thing. Support people who support the fishing industry if you can. If you know, if you if you know anything, if you're out spending money, try to support local. Try not to spend your money, you know, at big chain tackle warehouse. Nothing against tackle warehouse. I'm just saying, like, try to shop local if you can. Your mom and pop shops need you more than you realize. I don't think people understand that like we have local one here local that i try to always support field of pain fishing um that just opened and um you know just your you know your bass pros and stuff like johnny morris is gonna make it right he's gonna be fine i think he's gonna be just fine um but your you know your small shops really need you and if you're spending money like if you're like me and you're a tackle junkie like most people who watch your podcast are fishing enthusiasts like we're all i hope so we are i mean we are i watched yeah. it before i came on here right like i i've been a fan of the of the of podcast so like you know if you're spending your money out there on tackle every month try to buy local try not to buy online you know try to support people who are supporting your industry who are supporting your tournament trails that you're fishing locally and 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 you're not just sending your money off to attack a warehouse who's also got a tennis warehouse who's got a golf warehouse they have they're just they don't like yeah there's they're fishermen over there too but like they're also just a private company that just is involved in taking our money <laughs> uh essentially so shop local that like if that's uh if that uh, you know if that get that message across shop local people and you mentioned YouTube earlier, and this is a great segue for plugging you. How did you, you are you now getting into the old uh, YouTube thing? Have you been on YouTube for a while? No, I have not been on for a while at all. I I, I thought about, I, I a couple of years ago, I bought a GoPro and I was like, I'm going to do this. And then as with anything, I was like, I need to worry about catching fish and winning tournaments. So I just, I didn't document it. And I've really, I would say since christmas time of this past year i've really just kind of this year it's been my i'm going to film everything i do i'm going to try to you know you know chronologically figure out my whole season and, and document everything for for me but also for youtube like for learning purposes at first it was like oh i'm gonna document everything and just keep it all and then like this will be like my diary you know like how people do fishing journals and then i was just like i'll just log everything and then i realized like i need way more external hard drives and that's ridiculous i'm not going to do that so i was like i'll just youtube it just uploaded to youtube what i think is good and and like i said i was torn on should i give stuff away and i why I kind of at the point like it's as far as i just like I, yeah i'm torn on whether i should expose a our lakes around here uh b like I know we talked about prior like secret baits and stuff like there isn't really any secret. That's why I'm, I'm doing it. Right. Because it's like, I, I really don't, I, I kind of at the point where I don't want to hide anything anymore. I mean, I just kind of want to document what I'm doing so people can see a real life view of how I'm fishing. 
you know, and what, it, how I make decisions. Is that because of, I think this is fascinating by the way, is like the YouTube, st the YouTube stigma in particular, because I look at it that if, if Hank Parker shoots a show on Kerr Lake talking about a bait, no one cares because it's on Fox. If you do the exact same thing on YouTube, people would bitch being like, he's just a YouTuber doing it for the clicks. It's like, well, what the fuck is the difference between Hank Parker yeah. on a television show doing it when I get more views on my podcast than that guy does on his channel on cable? Like, but that's okay because he's yeah. on TV. Like, that's where I'm getting confused. Well, like, I, I think like, yeah, I, I think the, the YouTube thing, like you can't, like it's such a net you it's necessary now like in in our like you see it like a lot of the pro guys were against it of oh, these youtubers right you see Milliken, you see you know a lot of these guys are successful and they're building a whole ass living on fishing and they don't even fish tournaments they're youtubers no. right? i mean like and i mean that is the dream like i would love they're tv to hosts that. yeah they're yeah but they're getting to you know document their life go fishing edit their videos, be consistent with uploading. And I, I, I don't want it like, that's not my goal. I'm not really to, I just want to kind of use YouTube to obviously grow my brand a little bit. Cause that's important, you know, in fishing, like you can't be in this industry and fish for, you know, fish for tournament winnings and expect to survive. If you ever want to fish professionally, it's just not how it works anymore. And anybody will tell you that like being a great fisherman helps, but you've got to be a great salesman. You've got to sell product. You've got to help companies. You've got to do all those different types of things. And, um, you, you know, need to be you, your own brand. Yes. And YouTube is a huge part of it. Now you can't like no company is going to sponsor you nowadays and, and talk to you and think, Oh, well, what's what do you, they're going to ask you? What's your YouTube account? Well, how many followers you on Instagram? Have you got how many, like, that's what they want to know because that's a measurables. Like, it's not like back in the day in the nineties, two thousands, when KVD is just slamming them down. Like, you know what you're getting with KVD, but now the lines are so blurred because analytics on YouTube tell you exactly what you're getting. You're not guessing like there's no guesswork anymore. Like that's, I think they're just looking at it from a sponsorship dollar bang for the buck aspect. Like, You've just seen that shift in the last 10 years or maybe the last five years of like where, where are the sponsorship dollars going? The pot is getting smaller and smaller and it's shifting away from professional angling. And it's like, think about, you know, people like Matt, right? SB, like, I mean, he's a perfect example, like just doing his thing, fishing, you know, got, got it going on, doing videos, got a good following and doesn't need, I mean, he works with companies because he can, but he doesn't need like, to go fish a tournament yeah. trail. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, uh, there's just, it's changed the way we do things. And, you know, I'm not, it'd be nice to have, you know, 200,000 subscribers on YouTube, but even having five or four or 2K or whatever helps your brand in the fishing aspect of it. And it's necessary to have, you gotta be putting out content on YouTube. You have to. And I, and I also think it's the way you look at it too, of when, when you look at the old guy, like, oh, like I don't wanna blow up spots or whatever. And it's like, so you wanna lie. Because YouTube is the online authenticity is the currency of the future. Authenticity. And it's called the bullshit meter. You can't you can bullshit. see right through it. Yeah, you can yeah. see right through it, dude. <laughs> if you you're a fisherman not. and you know, like, yes, you can spot that bullshit a mile away. But you um, can't do that on YouTube. And that pisses a lot of people off. That, and this is the same thing when Bassmaster are doing live. And there are people that are pissed the time. It's like, well, you know, I don't even throw my sponsor's bait. Well, it's like, well, you're an asshole. Like, like that's that that's a yeah. you problem there. Um, yeah, I mean, you yeah. can't you can't hide anything in the YouTube era, right? Exposes everything. But I, I think it's not a bad thing. Like, I like that. No. Like, I, I like I, I generally like sharing with people what I'm doing. I like talking when I'm fishing on the water, and I try to get better at explaining and and not just fishing. But I think it's an important aspect. Like, right? I mean. Not everyone's a tournament fisherman. A huge, I mean, not 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 everyone. Like most people are not tournament fishermen. We're in the minority. I just don't think yeah. we realize it because we're snobs <laughs> inherently in tournament. We, like, we think we are the whole population, but think about how many people are just, 
you know, one or two poles and they're just going to a pond after work or something and cats and sink. I on. think that's because what pisses know. people off the most. Like, 100%. and that's what, that's what Milliken and that's what all those other people are gearing towards. Well, and, they, and they love them because they're just, they look like regular people. They don't got all these sponsors, they don't have all these jerseys on all this crap. They're just fishing and showing you how they fish and in real life. And they, people can relate to that. Relatability is important. Uh, no, 100%. And I'll go one step further because you've just mentioned examples, just YouTubers that do tournaments. Like the the POV, like uh, Creek Fishing Adventures, Dalton, I've had him on the show before. He hasn't fished really. He's getting into the kayak thing, but he fishes creeks. That's it. Like like you said, there's a lot of people that's like, shit, that's what I do. I have creeks and yeah, they're and they not in the tournament at all. Yeah, they yeah. relate to that. I think we just hog like, you know, tournament fishermen just think it's all about tournaments and that's all. And like, I die hard tournaments. That's all I think about. Yeah. Right. But, uh, I love fishing in general. I love fishing tournaments, but I think, you know, it's just, again, you can't pigeonhole yourself. You got to give like in YouTube, you've got to build your brand, give good content. That's relatable to all aspects of fishing. If that's what you're doing, you know, it's making be, people like you, the subscriber yeah. count is how many people just like you as a person. And I think we get so caught up in the statistics, we forget that they're real people. And like, I did a meet and greet at the Richmond Fishing Show, and I had like 300 people to meet, like to, that wanted to say hi to me. And that was the first time I realized, like, holy shit, these are not numbers, yeah. they're humans. Yeah. And that yeah. is a hell of a reality check. Yeah, it's reaches, the reach on YouTube is further than you can believe, right? Like, you know, it's just, you know, it's it, people resonate with that. I mean, you know how much traffic YouTube's getting every day, like uh, how much you know, I'm how much I've learned over the years off YouTube and the, I wish yep. God, looking back, I wish, you know, I've been watching YouTube since the Mikey balls days and all those days, like when those guys were putting in the work, like in just regular fishermen, not tournament fishermen, just fishermen out here. Like I should document this. And at the time I was like, ah, no, nah, I'm not going to document. I don't want to, I don't want to give anything away. I don't want to, I don't want people blowing up the spot, you know? And like, it took me years of realizing like, man, you just, you know, it's either you're going to be that way and you're going to win tournaments, but no one's going to want to work with you because you're not open, you're not honest and you're secretive, you know? And like, for me, I haven't, like, I guess if you put on enough clinics and you win enough tournaments, you get enough eyes on you. Some, somebody's going to call, but for me, it's like, I don't have a bunch of sponsors. I still don't. I probably won't, you know, it, it's just, I work with a few companies that help me and, you know, and believe in me, but you got to, in order, if you ever want to be like a, a true success story, you're going to have to work on building your brand and anything you do. Um, it doesn't just have to be fishing, but you got to be uh, related. Like you said, and you got to, people got to like you. That's important. You know, well, that's a great straight, segue well, too. <laughs> it doesn't No, help. like a hundred percent. And that's a great segue to like, let's promote your sponsors real quick before we get out of here. Like, I mean, who, yeah. who's been in your corner? Uh, I mean, honestly, I haven't had a whole lot of, of, of help, man. My, my, uh, work that I has been super supportive, uh, Crossfire Logistics, uh, we're a logistics company out of Hampton Roads. We do a lot of stuff. They've supported me since day one, uh, allow me to do what I like to do and fish and chase my dream. So big shout out to them. Kistler. I've been with Kistler for eight years now. Um, huge supporters. Like I'm, I'm a huge fan of their stuff, rods, reels. Um, so, and PH Custom Lures, I don't know if you've ever heard of of them. Um, they make a lot of good high-end wood baits. Um, Phil's a stand-up dude. He's been making great baits forever. Um, and so that's really it. So I, that's it. I, so my work uh, has supports me a lot, Crossfire, and then Kistler Rods and PH Custom Lures. And I, I was, when I was younger, I was kind of into that, like, I need to be getting sponsors and I need to have logos on my jersey and stuff. And I realized kind of early on, like, a, I'm not getting paid for that. I'm not getting salaries for any of that. Um, it's not helping me. I kind of look like a patch pirate and I'm not being a better fisherman. Right. Like, so I kind of, I had this realization of like, you know, I wanted to look the part, but you know, you got to be the part. Right. So I just kind of retracted that business ball a little bit. And now I just kind of, I, I don't pursue sponsorships. I don't reach out to people and no people don't, I just, I'm just kind of, I don't know, set in my ways right now. I just, I haven't had a lot of traction uh, as far as, you know, sponsorships are concerned. And I don't really seek them out, to be honest. I just kind of just go fishing, man. And the few people that have support me, support me a lot and, and help me, you know, Trey, like I can pick up the phone and call Trey with Kistler. I can pick up the phone and call Phil with, you know, so those, you know, those two people are important to me. They've always supported me and helped me with products and stuff. So um, big shout out to them. And like I said, my work, and that's, that's really it. 
Um, so I don't have a whole lot of boat, you know, brands. I don't have any marinas that I work with or do boat dealerships or bait companies. It's just it's a couple people, man. And dude, just- yeah, <laughs> I think you got a bright future ahead of you. Um, in the industry, just keep doing that grind, get on YouTube, start posting some crap, um, to yeah, get that algorithm to work in your favor. I'm trying. I've been, you know, the shorts have been really working for me a little bit. I've been gaining quite a few followers every day on little short videos I've been posting. Not getting a ton of traction on my my regular stuff. But then again, I haven't filmed a ton. I'm going to try to make sure I wear it a lot and film a lot this year and try to have some content for people. I'm trying to get better at editing. That's hard. I'm sure you know. Um, you know, editing is not easy, right? I'm a little, every time I launch Premiere Pro, I'm like, oh. <laughs> it's not easy. I'm, I'm getting the eye for it though. I'm starting to see like what, you know, now, even on the water, right? So like I'm starting to like, yes, you know, when I caught the big live bait fish the other day, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do a couple short clips of me casting leading up to it. And, you know, a couple of short in and outs of me casting, 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 nothing, nothing, then lead up to the, you know, so I'm trying to figure out how to segue and make everything flow and do transitions. It's, it's not easy. So I got mad now that I'm doing it, like fishing is, Hard and then you try to f- do all that fish all day, win a tournament, come home, spend four hours editing the video, piecing it together, doing perfect transitions, doing voiceovers, all that stuff. It's, it's, I see, uh, I see. I don't know how Matt does it. I don't do. I don't know. Probably why he sleeps in a van, honestly. Dude, it's sense. hard. It's hard. I like, I, I asked, I've asked him for a few tips on like, you know, Premiere Pro and editing and different things. And it, it's just, it's hard. It ain't easy at all. And it, you know, you get sloppy product if you rush it, you know, and you know, I'm still learning. I, I think I probably know a 0.1% of what I need to know to truly run a uh, premier pro, but enough to get a few clips together and get it, you know, uploaded at least. Well, um, I mean, you know, I, ask Hunter, uh, HP fishing, man, he's pretty good with premier pro. He'd definitely be able to help you out. Um, yeah. I know Hunter. I, I like Hunter, man. He's a good dude. Um, I, I'll have to get with somebody, but, I got to get good content to start with. So I got to get, so I got to start wearing the camera when I win big tournaments. That would be important. You know, it so, would, yeah. Like, it, like uh, Matt Downs, like immediately was like, Oh man, I can't wait to watch your video. I was like, Oh, I forgot to wear the GoPro. He was like, you idiot. <laughs> you idiot. What are you doing? You got to wear it. You know, um, it would have been epic and I'm going to, hopefully we'll have some big eats at Smith Mount Lake this weekend. Hopefully I'll be putting together some footage next Monday of some, some great stuff. You just got to keep it going. I mean, that's the thing I've learned. It's consistent. constantly. Be consistent and don't slack off. Like it's with anything. If you, you're only going to get out of it, what you put into it. So you've got to go all in on it. And I've realized that now I'm going all in on it. We'll see where I fall. So, well, I mean, Chaz, I mean, thank you so much for coming on the show. And yeah, if you need help with anything when it comes to the I'll YouTube stuff, it. just let me know. Um, as always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Uh, please go help him out. Please go support him on YouTube. Do we even mention your YouTube channel name? Shit, I don't think we did. Uh, we probably didn't know. So it's uh, <laughs> CT, CTC Fishing. Um, so pretty easy. CTC Fishing. Perfect. Guys, that'll be linked in the episode description as well. Check us out on Patreon. Uh, we're trying to hit our goal. We are starting a nonprofit. We have permission from the Department of Wildlife Resources for for, for Virginia and Maryland to do supplemental stocking of our local waterways. So help us reach our goal so we can actually start doing that for our places. Like and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.